Why did he come for me? The sea is endless. Endless is the sea. It begins with the tide curled inside me with no rhythm. Islands a long way off. Some tall with their mountains in the clouds. Some rounded like a woman's body. The island where I was born is called Madanina, Isle of Flowers. But my mother calls it Land of Ghosts. I was a mermaid, brown as magnolia petals fallen to the ground. It was only later that I became white. After they shut me up in the room, my feet became soft. I could no longer walk on the coral. My mother held my hand in the foam. This is the salty cradle. The invisible underwind that pulls and tugs. I love the world beneath the sea. Our little house is painted coral, with lavender shutters and a grass roof. People come to see my mother when they are ill, and she cures them. She knows how. She has a bag for the magic. I know she thought it was best for me to go with him, but why did he come for me? Dark Shadows, Angelique's Descent, Part One, Innocence. She could see her heart when she closed her eyes, small and gray, polished like a stone tumbled in the surf. Today, something felt cruel, like a punishment. She was a wild child who had never been curbed or threatened. The sea had taught her caution. Her father's fingernails cut into her palm, pulling her along. She stumbled along the muddy road at his side, and his fingers pinched her when he lifted her into the cart. "I want to be proud of you," he whispered, his voice full of warning. The slave boy whipped the pony, and the cart lurched forward. She looked down at her white dress and felt a quiver of pride. She had seen the dresses of lace and poppies worn by the other girls. But hers was the most delicate. But why had he come for her today? What did he want from her? This father she rarely saw. Her mother had said he was taking her to Saint Pierre to raise her as his daughter. Then why hadn't he said a word to her? Father, where are we going? Her mother brushed the sun and the sand from her body. Then she took down the festival dress and pulled it on over her head. She greased her hair and darkened it with oils. Her hair so yellow and tangled, like the seaweed where she swam. It hurts when you comb my hair. Her mother pulled it tight and tied it with colored ribbons. And she looked at her reflection in the window, and she felt changed into some exotic thing. I don't like it. It's too frilly. Then she turned and saw the bright tears in her mother's eyes. Her father was a shadow against the sky, cut out of the blue, like a paper silhouette, looming in his black coat, his beard like dried eel grass. He was a blanc, white-skinned, even with his ebony eyes and his coal black hair. That was why he never came to see her and her mother, because they were colored, and because her mother had been the daughter of a slave. Once he had come when she was a baby and held her on his knee. She had played with his beard and touched his sweaty brow. You have the strangest eyes, he said. Eyes as changing as the sea, her mother had answered with pride, transparent as the water in the lagoon, sometimes turquoise or opal, and sometimes they be dark as storms. Her father grabbed her mother's wrist and pulled her sharply. Where did those sea green eyes come from, Cymbeline? You said she is mine. Can you not tell? She come from your pride, all right. How dare you to doubt? She have your mark on her. Her father had pushed her dress up and looked at the back of her leg. There was a dark birthmark, a red blotch in the shape of a coiled snake. He rubbed it with his thumb, and sighed heavily, and put her down. The wind was gusting, and the road was rutted and rough. The palms waved their long leaves like giant knives. Her father was sweating under his coat. The shoes her mother had forced onto her feet had begun to rub. 
She stopped thinking her ribbons were beautiful. Her hair hurt from being pulled too tight. What did he say to her mother? I want her to have the best. She is light-skinned and can pass, but I don't want you to come around and ruin things. The rain fell in sheets. All along the road, the flowers, battered by the gale, hung limp, their color drained and bruised. She wondered if it would be a great storm, like the ones that tore the roofs off the houses. Why couldn't my mother come? She decided it was time you come with me. She looked out at the harbor as the cart moved slowly into St. Pierre. Is it a large house, Father? Large enough. Is it made of wood? It's made of stone. She wondered if it would be grand. She could feel the sack of clothing lying by her feet, and she was glad she had her journal to show her mother when she came for a visit. Angelique thought again of what he had said. I don't want you to come around and ruin things. The car passed in front of the warehouses, the arched doorways staring bleakly at the empty docks. Under the awnings, she could see newly arrived slaves bound in their chains. Their black skin made them almost invisible in the shadows. She had seen slaves sold at auction. Perhaps there would be an auction tomorrow, and she would be allowed to go. Do you have any slaves? she asked. Her father scowled, preoccupied with other thoughts. Of course. How many? Too many. Not enough. The warehouse guard sat inside a small room that faced the wharf, the oil lamp flickering. As their cart rumbled by, the men shouted cruelly at the black men. With a cry, he let fly his heavy whip, and they shrank into the shadows. That man is whipping them. Without the whip, they are devils. She felt a sudden pity for the slaves. Her mother's mother had been freed because she had given birth to a light-skinned daughter. She thought of the reef, where the water was so warm and clear and the color so bright, and she wondered how many days it would be before she was swimming there again. The cart jostled up the main street. Here and there was a shutter left undone, but most were fastened. This must mean a hurricane was on its way, she thought, and she hoped her mother was safe back inside her shack. She reached for the charm that hung at her neck and fingered the soft, leathery ball. Inside, she could feel the snake's tiny skull. She had seen it coiled on the table before her mother had killed it. What a pretty snake. Is it poisonous? Poisonous, yes. But good for you, my little one. Make powerful Luanga. The green, iridescent ribbon had slithered around her mother's wrist as she slit its throat with her knife. Angelique had not been the least frightened. Instead, she had been fascinated. Her mother's powers were the most wonderful thing she knew. Every time she made magic, Angelique watched and remembered. When she finished the Uwanga, she tied it around Angelique's neck. Here, child, this will keep you safe. Why are your hands trembling, Mama? Her mother pulled her closer. This has always been my dream, my darling. You'll have a better life than ever I can give you. Must I go away? Yes. But I like it here by the sea with you. A planter's daughter with a velvet coat and a four-poster bed. You'll go to a fine school. You'll have pretty friends and music. She drew Angelique in a desperate embrace. Mama, why are you crying? My precious darling, if only you were not such an angel. Then her father had led her away. They started up the long avenue. This part of the town was beautiful, even in the rain, stone built with roofs of red tile. They passed the theater with its deep arches and its double stairway. Posters advertised an opera from Paris. Would he take her? She could not imagine anything more wonderful. She thought he must be angry with her. Perhaps he thought she did not want to go with him because she'd been so quiet. St. Pierre is a pleasing town. It is many colors, like the coral, she said as brightly as she could. He did not respond. The plaster houses held a promise of another life. Treasures from other lands, dresses of silk and velvet. Her mother had told her of the private dream life of the wealthy plantation owners and their families. She had also told her of the mulatto women 
who sometimes lived with the planters and gave them bastard children in return for a sweeter kind of slavery. Her mother could have done that. She was a handsome woman, but she was too proud. She had chosen another path, a magical way of healing, and kept her freedom. Rain drummed on the pavement, splashing between the buildings. The air was pungent, the streets empty, and still they did not stop. The cart pulled into a back street that headed out of the town. Isn't the house in Saint-Pierre? He looked coldly in her direction. No, not Saint-Pierre. Her heart sank. Where are we going? Into the hills. She decided to stop asking questions, and after a while she fell asleep. Her head fell trustingly upon his arm. She woke to hear the sea crashing against the rocks. The pony stumbled on the path, and she fell forward in the cart. Her father held her against him. She looked up, and she saw he was frowning at something down the road. She followed his gaze, and her heart leapt. A massive edifice stood high above the water, built of stone and surrounded by a wall. She knew this place from her mother's stories. Once, it was a great house, a fine castle, made by a wealthy man for his tender bride. But she died of the vapors on the eve of her wedding night. So it fell to ruin and became a sugar plantation. That's when the mill tower was built, and the chapel, and the slave quarters. Slaves worked in the heat until they died. They gave their lives to the sugar. What happened to the man? Killed by his own Negroes. He died for his sins. That house has a long and ugly history. Angelique grew anxious as the cart approached the forbidding structure. This isn't our home, is it? It is. But it's so dark and gloomy. When the pony came to a halt, her father reached for her and pulled her to the ground. His hands were icy cold. Then Angelique saw several other little girls her age, dressed as she was in white festival dresses. Why were they here? They all began to walk toward the great house, and she could hear some of the other girls whimpering softly. Her father's hand closed more tightly on hers as he strode along. People from the village were there as well, huddled along the path watching the procession. She recognized some of her friends, island girls of light color who lived along the shore. They proceeded in a long line towards a great iron gate in the wall. And then she saw the chapel, a small building in the courtyard with a cross above the door. Why were the village people so worried? They murmured to one another, their white faces grim. Some whispered and pointed in her direction. Others shook their heads and made the sign of the cross. Was it because she was wicked and would disgrace her father? She looked up towards the castle's turrets and rounded walls. Now that the sugar cane was gone, the jungle vines inched up the parapets. They passed through the gate and crossed a bridge over a moat of slimy water. The dark chapel loomed in front of them like a mausoleum. Suddenly, resolutely, she stopped and pulled on her father's hand. What is it, my angel? He feigned gentleness. I don't want to go in there. She was surprised by the sound of her own voice, sharp and clear. Its sound gave her courage. Where was he taking her? She belonged with her mother. What right had he to take her anywhere? Take me back. I don't like the church. Rage darkened her father's visage, and his eyes narrowed. He knelt down and looked in her face. Listen to me, Angelique. I want to go home. She thought of how her mother would have challenged him. Defiantly, she turned and ran. Immediately, she heard his heavy steps. Then suddenly, he caught her, smothered her against his rough jacket. His whisper was harsh in her ear. Think back to the day when I came to your mother, when I was so ill. Do you remember? I had the fever, and I was ranting and out of my mind. She remembered. He had staggered into their house, babbling and wild-eyed, his tongue black and thick in his mouth. Her mother had watched him passively as he heaved himself upon their mat, squirming in pain. Cymbeline, you must help me. My head is exploding, please. His eyes jerked and the white showed at their rims as he caught a glimpse of her. For the sake of the child, don't let me die. Her mother had placed a hand on his chest and listened. After a moment, she rose and looked down at him her hands on her hips and a wry smile on her face. Hey, you are not dying, Theodore Bouchard, she said. 
Your pain is of your own foolish doing. Some drink, no doubt, no? Her mother's voice was sweet with contempt. I will not help you. She had turned away and gone about her tasks, ignoring him now. He groaned even more. Bitter, jealous woman! Vage vixen! Yes, you were right about that. For God's sake, get rid of this agony. It's no drug. It's... it's... His eyes were bulging. It's the fever. One of those wretched Negroes who hates me. My favorite shirt is missing from the wash, and one of those miserable black demons has taken it, and now I'm dying. Do something, damn you. Take some, some, some hair, some blood. Cymbeline, help me, you filthy wretch. But her mother had turned her back on him, and lifting her basket to her head, she took the wash out to hang under the banana trees. Angelique followed her into the garden. Come and take one end, darling, her mother said. She loved to help hang the clothes in the wind. She lifted the flapping cloth and let herself be drawn into the colors. He lay moaning on the mat. Angelique! He had called her name. She turned, amazed that he would speak to her. Curious, she put down the pins, walked slowly to where he lay. She remembered how black he had looked under his pale skin. She couldn't see the light that pulsed from other people's faces. She thought it must be sucked away by his pain. She reached out her small hand to find it, and her fingers grazed his forehead. He sighed so deeply that she snatched her hand away. No, he had whispered, stroke my forehead, my little angel. Hesitant, she touched his head again. Ah, oh, yes, that's it. Push away the pain. Hesitantly, she pressed on his temples, moving her fingers into his hair, digging for the lost light. And to her amazement, with a long, guttural sigh, he had fallen asleep. This all came back to her as he held her smothered against his chest. She breathed in the musty odor of his body. Then he jerked her out and stared down into her face. I knew. That day I knew. You are not like these other girls. You have the power to change what you are about to see, to transform it with your mind. Nothing is real unless you will it to be. His fingers clenched her shoulders, digging into her skin. Make me proud of you, my daughter. At that moment, the stone of her heart opened a little. I'll try. He took her by the hand and led her forward. She would have given her life to please him, but they did not go into the chapel. Instead, the procession moved into the flagged courtyard and approached the building. There they stopped. Angelique saw a door with heavy iron hinges that yawned open above an underground room. He whispered in her ear, No crying out, you hear me? Whatever you do, don't blubber or shriek. What you see is not real. It is all a trick. The other children, suddenly aware they were to be sent to this room alone, began to moan. They clung desperately to their parents, terrified of being separated. And another sound, a mournful howling deep from within the castle walls, sent a shiver through them all. Angelique felt fear rising in her stomach. Her father tugged at the heavy door and pushed her forward. She felt herself shoved down into the darkness with the others. The door closed on the light, and suddenly she was standing in total blackness on cool earth. One of the girls began to sob. There was a movement in the blackness, the sound of fire exploding, and then sconces high above them brought the scene to life. As one mass, the girls gasped. On the floor in the center of the room was the head of a wild boar, ripped from the body. The coarse fur was spiked with blood and yellow tusks curved from the gaping mouth. The beady eyes stared out, the death terror still shining. Children screamed hysterically and threw themselves against the door, sobbing for their fathers. But Angelique pulled away. She thought the other girls were silly. Curiosity filled her mind as she stared at the animal. She knew that it was real, that it was no trick, and that her father had lied. But she also knew... As ferocious as it looked, there was no way it could harm her. It was dead. Then she heard whimpering, scraping, a mournful chorus of whines, 
that lifted every hair on her head. Animals, and these were alive, scratching at the wood of a separate door in the wall, clawing to be let in. The door fell back, and suddenly six wild dogs sprang forth, growling and snapping. They leapt upon the head of the boar with vicious snarls. The other girls had stopped their crying were huddled together, breathing one breath, their eyes huge, noses red and watery. Angelique watched, mesmerized, as the dogs devoured their bloody meal. Her mind was a swirling blur. Why had her father brought her here? How could he have thrust her into this place? Anger rose in her chest. Suddenly she wanted to punish him, make him regret this cruel abandonment. Was she some sacrifice to his dark religion? Father in name only? Suddenly she hated him, his hands cumbersome and graceless when he lifted her, his insistent voice, make me proud of you. She sucked in her breath. Her father had asked her to be brave. She had only to stand and wait. Suddenly the largest dog turned and looked at her. His eyes were glowing, his muzzle painted with blood, exposing his gleaming fangs. A low rumble quivered in his chest and he gathered, ready to leap. She knew she was helpless, but stood motionless. Slowly, she reached for the charm at her neck and pressed it between her fingers, feeling the tiny skull. The dog growled again, his eyes burning. Angelique could hear the crying of the other girls, but she was more hypnotized than afraid. Something was familiar here, some memory or dream. The dog inched towards her. She could feel his hot breath on her ankles. Wise enough not to move, she stood frozen. If only she knew more of her mother's magic. Invisible forces were everywhere. Winds that tore the trees and currents in the sea too strong to swim against. If only she could become invisible as the wind, fade into the wall, lose herself in the cold stones. She locked eyes with the dog, willing to be devoured, almost eager to... to what? To begin her life again? The dog's gaze was vacant. Then some inner demon flickered in his eyes, and they became two flames. His mouth seemed to curve into a fiendish grin. He looked at her as if he knew her, and laughed, a joyless laugh that was almost human. (laughs) Angelique, I've been waiting for you. Her heart stopped. Did she imagine that he spoke to her? Not in any language or voice, but in a dark thought that floated through her. He stared, as if to see whether she had heard his message. Then he slowly turned away and bent again to his grisly meal. The door flew back. Light poured in. The dogs cowered from the whip. The girls collapsed in their guardian's arms, sobbing with relief. Angelique walked into the sunlight. Her father was surrounded by the other planters who congratulated him, some pressing money into his hand. I won that bet, Bouchard. Amazing. Wherever did you find her? One of the planters glared at Angelique, then slapped her father on the shoulder. Well done, a little beauty. His skin was blotchy from drink, and his words were slurred. I suppose this makes you the master here, at least for a while. Let's hope so, Louis. Angelique looked up at her father, expecting praise. Was I brave? she asked. A younger planter stared at her with interest. Those eyes, so blue. She can't be more than nine or ten. Yes, it's a shame her skin is so light, said her father. In another time, a better fate might have been waiting for her. And would you sacrifice her to your shameless gambling debts? No, it's more than that, much more, her father moved away. It seemed he did not want her to hear what he had to say. Nasty business yet to come. I can't believe you look forward to that, Lewis muttered under his breath. Aye, but they want it, don't they? Reminds them of home, flesh of a child, time out of mind. Listen, they're already drumming. Angelique walked over impatiently. Was I brave? Her father answered brusquely. Very brave indeed. You are chosen. What do you think of that? Go now, get ready for the ceremony. When can I go home? He let go her hand and placed his fingers inside his waistcoat and turned away abruptly. He was immediately accosted by a fat priest who wore a long black habit and a wooden cross. 
But blasphemy, total blasphemy, Bouchard, the priest stammered in outrage. Did you support this crime, Monsieur de Salle? Louis de Salle glanced at Angelique with a smirk. Oh, I'm sure this little goddess is a graven image, he addressed the priest with feigned deference. But, Father, you have the protection of the church, and the slaves have some esteem for that. His voice was thick with rum. You need not fear waking up to your house burning or your throat cut. <laughs> he staggered on his feet. This is the way to, to rob them of their immortal souls, responded Father Lebrot, huffily, as though the conversation was a waste of time. Rob us all, I should think, another planter chimed in. He was an older man with white hair. Rob us of our profits, our rum, sick one day, dead the next. Father, was I brave? Her father glanced anxiously about to see if the other planters had heard, and quickly turned to the priest. Here, father, he stressed the word, she wants to speak to you. The priest turned to Angelique's father and spoke in a low voice. Did, did, did you just seriously intend to give her up to this atrocious ritual? It's brutal. We, we, we brought the Negros here to work for us. It, it's our job to s save their souls. <laughs> Do they have souls? Her father gave a mirthless laugh. All, all men have souls. They are born with purity that enables them to know God. Well, that true. We'd have to do everything in our power to keep them from finding out. He turned and called out harshly. Where are the negresses? Two female slaves approached timidly. Take the child and prepare her for the ceremony, and for God's sake, bathe her. She's filthy. They motioned to her, but Angelique would not move. She reached for her father's sleeve. Are you proud of me? He brushed her side. Of course. Come, child, urged one of the women. Reminding Angelique of her mother, it will be a big happiness for you, a game we can play. Reluctantly, Angelique followed the woman. She looked back over her shoulder for one last glimpse of her father, talking with the planters. He had forgotten she was there. She followed the two slaves across the courtyard and into the small door of the round mill tower. They climbed up a dark winding stairway. Angelique's eyes were fixed upon the wrapped head and the large, flowered rump of the slave who led the way. Once there was a tiny slit of a window through which she could glimpse the sea. Then the coiled path darkened once more. The air in the tower was dank. The only sound was the women's deep breathing and their footsteps clicking on the stone. At last they came to a heavy door with an iron bolt. It opened upon a large, round room at the top of the tower, furnished with a carved bed and a dresser. Curtains hung at tall windows and muted light flowed across the walls. The beds were covered with a red velvet cloth, and above it hung a sheer lace canopy. Angelique saw that all the trappings were European, ornate but shabby. What did my father mean when he said I was chosen? The older, larger woman seemed good-natured and gentle. Angelique instantly trusted her. They watch as you through a chink in the wall, high above where the dogs was. She glanced at her companion. What do they watch for? To see who be the goddess child? Her voice quavered, and Angelique sensed that she was making an effort to be cheerful. Now come here, child. We gots to make you pretty and clean. Gently the older woman led Angelique to a large enamel tub. She pulled off her dress and lifted her into the bath. She had never felt water so warm and smooth. But they would not let her enjoy it, and scrubbed her until her skin felt raw. She gave into the scrubbing like a limp doll, and they muttered to each other in musical words that Angelique did not understand. They lifted her out of the water and dried her shivering body. They combed her long hair until it was soft and golden, untangling the twisted curls. They pulled a gauzy white gown over her head, tied with scarlet tassels, then they draped her with strings of jewels. They led her to a looking-glass in the corner of the room. She barely recognized what she saw there. Her skin was whiter than she had imagined, and her golden hair burst like an aura around her delicate face. The older woman brought a pot and brush and began to paint coal around her eyes. It tickled, and Angelique pushed her hand away. Stand still and don't blink. There now. Ain't that pretty? Angelique frowned. Why are you doing that? So you'd be beautiful. 
All the slaves come to see you now. To, to see me? Why? In your robe and finery, because you sit there up on the altar. What altar? You the goddess now. They all come and bow down and worship you. This description seemed like a terrifying prospect to Angelique, and she was overwhelmed with dread. Something was happening that frightened her, more than the room with the dogs or her father's coldness. I want to go home, she wailed. My mom is waiting for me. No, no, baby, the large woman muttered soothingly. You stay here. We take care of you, feed you, dress you, because you the living goddess. Her voice quivered, and Angelique looked into the black woman's eyes for the first time. Tears glistened on her dark skin. Now the younger woman approached, her rusty skirt tied across her belly, and gazed sternly down on the weeping one. Thais, stop this. What if they come? Thais looked up at her. So what? We does it again? Look at this little child, Suzette. So cruel. Is your heart hard as a rock? What else can we do, Suzette retorted grimly. We refuse, they kill us. You know that, Thais. At these bitter words, Thais suddenly collapsed and holding herself began to rock back and forth. She was my child, my precious baby. Stop that, hissed Suzette. She wasn't your child. She was just another poor slave girl like this. And Now stop carrying on like this. If they catch you, they beat you. Fifty lashes like fire in your hide. We is both lucky to be here working in the house, so shut your mouth. Angelique, growing ever more disturbed, glanced around the room. She could see the one door with its metal bolt and three large windows, leaded and barred, set back in the thick wall. At the same instant, she noticed an enticing odor, spicy and warm, and Suzette approached with a tray of sweet pastries. There were meats wrapped in flaky dough and a goblet of liquid the color of gold. For me? she asked. Yes, child, all for you. Suzette's tone held the hint of covetousness. Go ahead, take some. Angelique realized how hungry she was. She reached for a pastry. There was warm, greasy chicken inside. She took a bite. Never had she tasted anything so delicious. Suzette watched with grim satisfaction as Angelique ate, licking her fingers and sipping the sweet juice from the cup. The whole time, Ty stared into space with a smothered dread. Then abruptly, she raised her head and her eyes flew wide. Angelique heard a far-off sound, and Tyus rose, sucked in her breath, and let out an anguished wail. The cry came from the chapel, a wrenching scream of complete and final terror. Angelique felt her blood run cold. What was that? Neither of the women answered. Tyus sunk into her chair, her face twisted with grief. But Suzette took Angelique by the hand, pulling her to her feet. Come on now, she whispered. They'll be wanting you. When your time be over, perhaps this will have all ended and, and you'll go free. You must hope for that. Angelique had no idea what she meant. She only knew that something terrible had happened and that she was going down into the church. She whipped her hand away and bolted for the door. The latch was hard to lift, and Suzette had her by the waist, but she managed to wrench free and pushed open the portal with a clang. She flew down the dark stairway, feeling every moment that she would lose her footing and plunge head first into the dizzying spiral. Suzette was close behind her, screaming, but Angelique was quicker than the heavy-footed woman. She spun away, and when she reached the bottom, she scrambled across the courtyard and threw herself against the gate to the outside. The heavy padlock struck her in the stomach hard. The chain was tight around the bolt. She looked around helplessly, and spying a door in the wall, she dashed towards it. Suzette's footsteps echoed behind her. Angelique, come back! The door gave way with a groan, and she scrambled down another stone staircase, her breath coming in gasps. She groped along the wall, terrified of falling, the stones beneath her feet slimy with moss. Behind her, Suzette's voice still called. Suddenly, the floor beneath her feet disappeared, and she felt herself tumble off some rough edge and splash into cold water. She was in the underground moat. She gathered her dress and sloshed through the pool. The fetid air told her that the water was tied backwash from the sea. 
as her eyes became accustomed to the gloom. She saw the stone walls rising around her. There was a far-off drumming sound, which she thought must be the surf pounding, and she rejoiced to think she might escape to the ocean. It was then she saw a light. It was at the top of another stairway, much more narrow than the first, steep like a ladder rising out of the water. Encouraged, she waded towards it and climbed. The drumming sounded nearer. She came to a wooden door and found herself in a small room lined with shelves laden with bottles. At the end of the room there was a ribbon of light beneath a heavy curtain, and thinking this must lead to the outside world, she scrambled beneath it. At first Angelique didn't know what she was seeing. It was as though she was poised at the edge of a cavern, and the night sky had fallen and flooded the chamber with stars. But no, they were flames, tiny flames, thousands of candles flickering in the blackness. The humming and murmuring came from the throats of dozens of black men, crowded into the church, each holding a candle and swaying to the rhythm of drums. She was in the chapel. She blinked back, hot tears, defeated. The heavy drums pulsed and shook the air, and she looked in horror upon a swaying mass of sweating bodies. The men were chanting, entranced by the drums. Her eyes darted about, searching for a way out, and she thought she would vomit. The food she had eaten was having a stupefying effect on her. Her vision blurred, and her legs became like water. She tried to run, but she reeled, collapsing in the arms of Suzette, who had come up behind her. She felt her limp body lifted on a high wooden platform. Seated above the men, she could hardly see through the haze. On a huge porcelain dish, she saw pieces of some sacrificed animal, sliced into sections and still oozing. She wrenched her eyes away. She saw her father standing in the sanctuary, and she felt a flush of hope. But he did not come forward. His gaze was not one of affection or pride. He seemed both angry and resigned, as though rejecting and accepting a fate greater than he could control. He lifted a long sword above his head and held it drawn out a moment, the handle in one hand and the tip in the other, like a bridge over his head. It glinted in the flames, but it was darkened with a rusty stain. He bent and kissed the blade, and placing the sword on the altar beside Angelique, took up the porcelain dish. He turned to the congregation and moved among them, passing out morsels of the bloody meat. Each dancer took a piece of the offering in his mouth. The chanting and drumming reached a frantic pitch. Angelique watched the ceremony through the veil of whatever opiate they had given her. The dancing bodies became monsters. There were candles glowing from their heads, and the bouncing lights traced arcs of fire in the dark. Men leapt high in the air and cried out. Vaguely, she saw that she was the center of the ceremony. They were circling her. One fell to the foot of the altar, babbling, and Angelique knew he was possessed. She had seen these things at ceremonies in the village, but her mother had always pulled her away. She felt as though she were falling, and she stopped herself with a violent jerk, placing her palms on the platform. Some liquid, wet and warm, was spilled there. She lifted her hand and recoiled at the smell and looked down. She was sitting in a pool of drying blood, which dripped onto the floor in a dull crimson puddle. She looked at the dark blotch, wondering what it could mean, and her gaze traveled to a round mass lying beside it, slick with congealed gore, with tendrils like tangled seaweed. And then she realized it was not seaweed at all, but matted human hair, and she was looking into the glassy eyes of a dead girl. It was then that she lost consciousness. When Angelique awoke, she was back in the tower room alone. It was daylight, but the rain was still falling, and she lay listening to the pounding on the roof above her head. Beneath the sound, she heard the noise that had woken her, it was a female slave screaming. She pulled aside the lace canopy of the bed and looked around. 
The porcelain tub where she had bathed was still filled with oily water. Her satchel of books and clothes lay on the floor, and at her feet was a faded carpet. She heard the voice again. No, Massa, please don't. I couldn't stop her. Her too fast. Please, Massa, please. Angelique leapt up, ran to the window, and looked down. The top of the tower was about twenty feet above the earth. The courtyard was empty. Rain silvered the cobblestones. Her father and another man appeared from beneath the tower, dragging the slave Suzette. The man was dressed in field clothes, but he was a blanc. Angelique knew he must be the overseer of the plantation, for he carried a heavy whip and had Suzette by the wrist. Suzette dug in her heels, and her one free hand clawed at his arm. He jerked her to a wooden post, ripped her ragged scarf from her head, and wrapped it around her wrists, tying her there. Please, Martha, it was my fault. She run like a rat. It never happened again. Never, no. Angelique clung to the bars of the window, trembling. The heat rose to her face. She had never seen a slave beaten, and had never believed such cruelty existed. When the lash struck, Suzette arched and screamed as if her voice had been ripped from her body. Angelique closed her eyes and turned away, but she could still hear the cracks of the lash until the cries faded, and there was only the hollow thwack of the whip. When it was finally quiet, she summoned the courage to look out again. She saw Suzette's body slump to the wet ground. Angelique's father walked over and stared down at the slave, and then, as if he knew she would be there, he looked up to where she stood at the bars of the tower window. She realized with shock that he had wanted to be certain she had seen everything, and her heart froze. Images flashed in her mind of the night before, moments of what must have been a dream. Slaves filing out of the dark silently, each one stopping a moment at the great front portal. There, her father administered a sacrament, touching each forehead with holy water, placing something in each mouth. Then the door had swung shut, and the long line of men had trudged off into the night. Angelique waited to see if Suzette would rise, but she lay limp and motionless. Finally, Thais crept out, gathered the slave in her arms, and carried her inside. After that, the courtyard was empty again. Angelique realized she had bitten into her lip, and it was bleeding. She was suddenly aware of how hot it was in the tower room. She placed her hand on a post of enormous size that penetrated the floor. Looking up, she saw that the post meshed with the huge gears of a horizontal beam protruding through the wall. She realized the windmill was attached to this post, and that its grinding sound was the windmill straining to turn the crushers beneath the floor. But the sails were so torn that the windmill floundered helplessly. She looked around the room. She saw a tray with tempting pastries arranged on a dish, but her stomach felt sour when she thought of eating. She heard the latch at her door and whirled to see her father. She was standing behind a chair and closed her hands around the wood and squeezed tight. She felt prickling at her armpits and her arms stuck to her sides. He glanced at the tray of food and frowned. You haven't eaten your breakfast. I don't want it. Take me back to my mother. She was startled by her own brashness. Her father shook his head. Aren't you tired of living in that shack with never enough to eat? We are not poor, Angelique said. The garden and the sea provided everything she and her mother needed. Here you will have everything you desire. You'll live like a princess. And will you beat the slaves that care for me? He hesitated only a moment before he answered. Yes, if you try to run away. She felt a wave of panic. He had tricked her. Her mother's dreams were all her father's lies. She fought her tears, but her father seemed oblivious. A twisted smile broke through his scowl when he looked at her. If only you could have seen yourself last night. His voice seemed almost reverent. They were mesmerized. I could not believe it. You promised I would have the life of a planter's daughter. You lied. Her father sighed deeply again and walked to the window. I am a planter, he said, looking out.
Where are your fields? Where is your fine house? He laughed mirthlessly. <laughs> Every morning I wake wondering exactly that. He rubbed his eyes. Uh, it's a wretched business. He leaned against the bars and spoke in a low voice as though he were talking to himself. Yeah, last year, the hurricane destroyed the crop. Twice the slaves have risen up and staged revolts. Futile, but revolts nonetheless. There have been many uh, situations. They have their ways with poison. Some kill themselves by eating dirt. Some escape, leap from the point into the sea to be free. His voice trailed off. Although she did not understand much of what he did say, Angelique felt a surge of conceit that he was confiding in her. Ah, slaves are savage and bitter. We have tried to convert them to Christianity, but they have ancient practices brought with them from Africa. They worship gods who take on many forms and are all superstition. They are not real. Loas are real, whispered Angelique softly. Her father glanced at her quickly. What do you know about them? That they come into your head? He frowned. Do you know of a loa called Erzuli? Mm, the love goddess. Ah, so you do. Amazing. Well, there is a worship of Erzuli at the plantation. The slaves are devoted to her. You, they believe you, are her human form. The goddess come to life. Me? But she's a woman with many husbands. They think that you appear by magic at the ceremony and grant wishes. Foolishness, of course. But as long as they believe you, they stay content in their work. But won't they find out? That's why you must remain hidden. If they were to see you, outside, or with your mother, they would know the truth. They'd probably slit your throat. So it's very important for them to believe you are the spirit. B but it's all lies. He stepped in front of the mirror and glared at his own image. Come, see for yourself. He pulled her to the glass. The touch of his fingers made her shiver. Is that god you see there not a goddess? Her hair had dried into pale ringlets which shone about her face. Her features were delicate, but overshadowed by her eyes, huge and gray. She felt sweat trickling down her body. She reached her hand to her throat and brushed her mother's charm, hung beneath her dress. What you see is beauty, he breathed hard. Beauty is rare, but you have a gift that is rarer still. There is something bewitching about you. I need to use that. And if you refuse, I shall force you. She felt a spasm of helpless fear. But there was blood on that altar. What happened there? Her father reached into the pocket of his coat and removed a flask. It was nothing. They sacrificed a goat. He took a long swig of rum. He seemed broken. Angelique felt a stab of pity. How long would I have to stay? Uh, not long, he muttered. Only a little while. She had a flash of hope. Can my mother come and live here too? Her father began to pace again. Your mother has her own life. Does she know? Of course she knows. She wants me to do this? It was a moment before he answered, and when he did, her heart turned again to stone. Your time with your mother has ended, Angelique. Despair tumbled through her. That's not true. You lied to her. He leaned forward and grabbed her by her hair, his hot breath against her face. There was desperation to his anger. Do not defy me, Angelique. You have seen my method of punishment. He threw her to the floor and stared down at her, his fingertips quivering. Listen, girl, you are no longer your mother's daughter. Or my daughter, either, for that matter. He took a deep breath and evened his tone. I need you here. You have a new role in life, which you can fulfill with pride. I suggest, I beg you to do so. He walked to the door and closed it behind him. She saw the bolt fall. 
and heard the iron clang as it fell into place. How long she wept, how long she slept, she did not know because she was drugged. The slaves woke her and gave her food, and she slept again. There were times when the moon rose over her, and she saw it glimmer on the sea, and there were times when the sun turned the stone wall beside her to gold. But mostly she hovered in a gray twilight, too desolate to force herself awake when the opiates wore off, rather than suffer the pain of separation from her mother. There were times when they carried her down the tower stairway and placed her on the altar in a stupor while the men danced around her. Sometimes she felt she was not alone on the platform and that some unseen presence sat beside her. She remembered being adorned with chains, decked out for a celebration. She did vaguely remember seeing her father and a look of displeasure on his face, but it barely affected her, and in truth, she had no idea why he would give her such a look. There were times when she felt clearer, but these moments floated past in the flow of days. She dreamt of the sea, remembering how different it was beneath the surface near the reef where she could swim for hours. She dreamt of the sea creatures in their dappled world, their colors gleaming. She dreamt that she was one of them, her round body forced into the shape of a fish. She would flutter gently as she slept. In her dream, her mother was always moving, her body lithe, and different expressions flickered over her face. Love flowed out of her. Angelique dreamt of her mother's fingers combing through her hair. The ceremony became more familiar. She stayed hidden in the room behind the altar while the drums pounded like thunder in the sky. After she appeared on the platform, the dancing became less frenzied and the slaves became gentler, as if their grief dissolved in her presence. The men surrounded her, and she felt clothed in their adoration. Often their hands would reach up and touch her feet. It did not frighten her, for they softened when they touched her and became less angry. There were times when she could not help being drawn into the frenzy. The sweating bodies, the smoke and flickering lights sucked her into the spell. She would feel pulses of heat pour into her, and she was aroused by her need to take into her flesh their betrayal along with her own. She would plunge into a well of despair. Her fists would clench, and she would scream in agony, finally fainting into grief. Early one morning, she woke with a clearer head than usual. She heard Thais enter with a tray of food. She turned and smiled nervously to see that Angelique was awake. Well, I declare, honey child, you wake up, morning and no rain be coming down. Get a solid meal in your belly. Today you be going to town. Thais eyed her nervously. Come along, I got to put you in your dress. You a little more awake than usual, ain't you? Be a good girl now, you hear? Angelique pushed the plate off the table and it clattered to the floor. What for you do that? Because the food makes me sleep all the time. Tyus looked guilty. Well, that may be true, honey, but it be for the best. Frog when he's sleeping, no, no, the snake come. You gots to eat or I's in big trouble. I want to be awake. How long have I been sleeping? Weeks? Months? Tiles placed an arm around her, her soft face hung under her liquid eyes. Oh, Lordy, she sighed. Angelique suddenly remembered a dream from the night before. Her father had been in her room, and he had come to her bed and stared down at her angrily. She is too drugged, he said. She must be more awake for the ceremony. Why is she like a zombie? Why do you drug me, she asked Tiles. What was I supposed to do? You ran from Suzette. Tyre's words came in a rush. The master be hollering at me. Why is she so sleepy? And I say, she got to be, or she run off. And he say, she go drooping that way, she not looking like the goddess. The only reason you are awake is that last night he told me not to give you none of the drink. Today you got to go into town and be lively. She gave Angelique a hug. The truth is, I was glad to see you awake. She rose and moved to a wardrobe. Look here at this pretty dress. Thais took out a rose-colored frock and laid it on the bed. The dress was not new. Little tucks at the waist and the faint traces of seams let out showed that it had been worn by others. 
Still, it was the prettiest dress Annalie had ever seen. You been to Carnival, honey? said Thais, coaxing her out of her shift. My mother takes me every year. Everyone, slaves, masters be there. This dress come all the way from Paris. What do you think about that? The dress slid over her head and she stroked the fabric with her fingers, drinking in the rosy color. Taz fastened golden bracelets around her wrists and arranged flowers in her yellow hair. She turned to Taz. Please don't make me sleep. I, I want to be awake. I hate it, but you're going to run off, I just know. I won't run away, I promise. You'll do this for me and for Erzuli. What about Erzuli? I want the goddess to come to me. If she thinks I am pretending to be her, then maybe she will come into my head and I will know her. Taz's expression softened. She drew Angelique into her arms. Maybe she will do that, she said in a low voice. Maybe she get jealous and come. That would be just like her, too. After a long wagon ride, Angelique and Taos reached St. Pierre. The sounds of the carnival hummed in the air. There were throngs of people, not only slaves dressed in costume, but also the Blancs, taking part in the joyful celebration. Angelique was hidden in her carrier, and her father surprised her when he came to the curtain and looked in. They're out of sight until the worship begins, he said sharply. The cavalcade began. It was hot in the carrier and hard to breathe, and she could hear drums and tambourines shouting and singing in the sound of footsteps. She longed to see it all. She could not resist peeking. Slaves surrounded her carrier, waving banners, chanting for Erzuli. Deep drums and shouts announced a crowd of white-robed figures carrying a larger platform than hers. Teetering on the top of the platform was a straw effigy. His huge face was painted yellow, and three red horns protruded from his head. He was the king of the carnival, and she remembered how frightened she had been the first time she had seen the paper giant's toothy grin. When they reached the part of the town closest to the wharf, they turned down the road towards the woods. She peered out at the docks, where groups of fishermen had come to join the fete. There was a schooner in the harbor, flying a flag she had never seen, with red and white stripes and white stars on a field of blue. And near the largest warehouse, she saw a group of soldiers in scarlet jackets. She leaned out, determined not to miss the gleam of their brass buttons. Angelique realized as she drew closer that they were actually teenage boys. Their boisterous banner betrayed their ages, and she longed to keep watching them, but fearing her father's wrath pulled her curtain closed. When she felt the chaise set down on the ground, she dared to peek out again. They were now in a large forest clearing, with an enormous bonfire at its center. Angelique ached to descend from the carrier. It was cruel torture that she must remain out of sight. Torches flamed before the dark trees. Drums were set up before the bonfire, and several drummers began to beat out their infectious rhythms. She leaned further out and realized her entourage had wandered off and left her. Only Thais was drawing a sheet over four poles to make her altar. Her father was nowhere in sight. The soldiers were only a short distance away. One was tall and slim and seemed older and an officer. Others huddled near him, crying out in disbelief or amazement at all they saw. She overheard them call him Jeremiah and realized he was in charge of this unruly gang. He smiled and nodded, treating the boys with familiarity. One handsome boy seemed a closer companion than the others, and she saw the officer grin at the youth and tossle his hair. Then the two turned and looked towards her carrier, and the boy stared at her with curiosity. He made a move to approach, but the officer must have called him back, because he suddenly turned, and she heard, Come away from there. She was surprised to hear English spoken. She pulled the curtain open a little more. The young man was standing by the officer, nodding in her direction. The older man shook his head vehemently and put an arm around the boy's shoulder, leading him away. The young man looked back, and this time he caught her eye. For an instant, he remained still, gazing in amazement. Then he did a very odd thing. He pursed his lips, and lifting his chin, 
kissed the air in her direction. At that moment, a torch was laid, flooding the giant effigy with flame. The garish yellow face seemed to glow from within, the mouth slowly opening in a diabolical grin. Leaping bodies tumbled into a circle, chanting their hypnotic song, glowing limbs undulating with the drums. Angelique pulled her curtain shut and closed her eyes until the cadence entered her body and the throbbing was the beat of her own heart. Hello, she started. The whisper was near, just outside the drape, a boy's voice, teasing and intimate. She shrank back, pulling herself into the corner. She waited, afraid to breathe, only to see the curtain slowly part and feel a shaft of light fall on her face. She snatched the curtain closed, but in a moment the drapery inched open again. Hello, he whispered. I just want to look at you. I've never seen a real goddess. She was terrified that her father would return at any moment, and she stared at him, not knowing what to do. He was smiling. Brown curls fell loosely on his forehead, and his dark eyes flicked over her face. Finally, she found her voice. What do you want to talk to you? You are not allowed to speak to the goddess. But you aren't a real goddess, are you? Heat rose to her face. Yes, I am. I am Erzuli, the goddess of love. He laughed. <laughs> what a jolly good prank. Better than the man who could make fire. Jeremiah said you were dangerous, but look at you. You wouldn't harm a rabbit. Why don't you believe me? Because I can see in an instant, even with the paint around your eyes, that you are flesh and blood. You are such a dazzling creature that I don't mind in the least. Go away. A sob caught her throat. He was the first person other than Tyus and her father to speak to her in such a long time. At her distress, his smile faded instantly. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to frighten you. Don't cry. But the tears fell onto her cheeks and she was helpless to stop them. Before she knew what was happening, the boy had climbed into her carrier and pulled the curtain closed. For a moment she sat paralyzed. He frowned. Is it because I'm a soldier? You mustn't mind this silly uniform. It's only from school. He smiled, and taking his shirt cuff in his fingers, he dabbed at her cheeks. Oh, your eyes are so big and worried. Are you from England? she whispered. No, New England, the state of Maine. I came with my schoolmates to learn all about sailing and boats. I wanted to go to Africa, but my father refused. And did you learn anything? That sailing is the hardest labor and tedious besides. I was seasick the entire time. Uncle Jeremiah brought us to the islands. We heard there was a carnival here in Martinique. And I begged to see it. And I'm very glad we did, because I was able to see you. And he lost himself a moment in looking at her. Has your volcano ever erupted? Paley, she said no. But when the god is awakened, it rumbles and spits fire. I should love to see that. Would you like to see my treasure? He reached into his breast pocket and withdrew a small sack. There is a ship in the harbor that belongs to the great mogul from India and carries silks embroidered with gold. Jeremiah's gone aboard, and this is what they have in India. He poured a handful of jewels into her lap. What do you think? Angelique looked at him in wonderment. Look at this one. It's called a moonstone. He placed a pale white stone in her palm. The moon is captured there. He rocked the stone slightly so that she could see it flash. Do you see? Oh, yes. He folded her fingers around it. It's for you to remember me by. And he leaned in and kissed her softly on the cheek. Barnabas, are you in there? The boy placed a finger across his lips. Come out of there this minute, came a furious voice. The boy scooped his jewels from her skirt. Then he tumbled out of the chaise and fell on the ground. He was jerked rudely up by the man called Jeremiah. God, Barnabas, are you mad? His voice was more fearful than harsh. His eyes flew to Angelique and he looked anxiously about him. If they caught you, they would kill you. You would never see it coming. A puff of dust and that would be the end of you. Barnabas winked at Angelique, but Jeremiah took him by the collar. Come along, young man. Back to the ship before I lose my temper. 
Angelique could hear their voices fade as they moved away. Good Lord, Barnabas, you are in my charge. My brother would see me shocked. The last words she heard were the boys. They've made her into a silly idol, and she's only a child. She held the moonstone in her fist for a long time, sticky with sweat, before she was able to open her fingers and look at it again. She tipped it until its moon danced. She reached for the wanga and pulled it from her neck, untied the knot, and placed the moonstone inside, beside the tiny snake's skull. Late that night, when the ceremony of Erzuli began, she stood in her rose-colored gown, with her golden hair falling about her. Candles starred the darkness, and the slaves sang and lay their gifts at her feet. She wondered whether he was there, standing behind the swaying crowd, watching her with his merry eyes, the boy whose name was Barnabas. Months passed, and the loneliness of her life became suffocating. She filled the hours staring out the barred windows. One looked out to Saint-Pierre. She tortured herself with thoughts of how she had fallen to sleep so trustingly on her father's shoulder. She wondered if she could find her way home. Another window looked over the cliffs to the sea. She often thought of Barnabas, the boy she had met at the carnival, and wondered whether he had sailed safely home. A third window framed a view of the inner courtyard, and it was here she kept her vigil. If she rose early, she could see the slaves turned out of their quarters in groups to toil in the cane, dragging their tired bodies over the hill before the overseer's whip. Her father's new cane fields lay spread out against the horizon, straggly and sparse. She wondered if his crop would be a good one, and whether this would make him kinder to her. Within the courtyard, she could watch the comings and goings of the slaves who cared for her. Below, scattered about the courtyard, were wooden troughs for the cane juice and a shed for the kettles, all abandoned. It had been many years since this was a full working plantation. Angelique had one occupation that consumed more and more of her thoughts. Each time a ceremony was held in the chapel, she was kept in the dark room behind the altar. Long, frightened hours spent listening to the drums had given way to curiosity and then discovery. She began to inspect the grimy shelves cluttered with amazing paraphernalia. She found enamel bowls and pitchers, an assortment of daggers and scalpels. There were tins of powders, jars of salves, and boxes of herbs. Some of the objects she had seen in her mother's possession, but most were unfamiliar and fascinating. Inside a carved wooden box she found, wrapped in silk, a beautiful chrys, encrusted with brightly colored jewels, its blade razor sharp. The most exciting discovery was a pile of books stacked in the corner, thick with dust. Some contained hieroglyphics she could not decipher, drawn in fine calligraphy. There was one book more precious than all the rest. Inside she found long descriptions of ceremonies, chants, and songs. She silently read the words over and over, listening to the sounds in her mind. Thais always slept in the tower with Angelique on a wooden bench beside the wall, but after a time she became more trusting, and the door to the room was sometimes left unlocked. When the slaves were off on errands and the castle was deserted, Thais would allow Angelique to come down the stairway as long as she remained within the inner courtyard. Angelique began to explore her prison. The door to the chapel was always bolted, and the grounds were surrounded by the wall and the moat. One side of the castle rose high above the cliffs, with walls that fell away to the sea. Angelique easily rediscovered the underground tunnel to the chapel she had found on the first day. There was a narrow ledge beside the water, and she was able to climb in secretly and read from the book. Finally she smuggled the heavy volume up to her room and kept it hidden under her bed. One day when she was sitting at the window, she saw a new slave girl come out of the kitchen. She looked the same age as Angelique and had glowing copper skin. Her job was to scrub the courtyard pavers. She appeared with a large bucket and drew water from the well, singing a simple African song in a high voice. Angelique watched her intently, her narrow back leaning over her task, her sharp elbows sticking out of her ragged dress. A butterfly circled her head and she leapt up and chased it around the yard. 
and she began to skip and twirl. A shout from Suzette, Chloe! And she began to scrub once more, but not for long. The next bucket she raised from the well spilled over her feet, and she splashed in the puddle. Angelique ached to become her friend. She began to realize that Chloe was sleeping in the kitchen. Early in the morning she would be there drawing water, singing her little song. Then she would spend the day washing the stones or scrubbing pots. One morning when the girl was at the well, Angelique took a bun from her breakfast tray and, stretching her arm through the bars, tossed it to the ground. It landed at Chloe's feet, and she looked up quickly. "'Is the sky fallen?' she cried, then glanced back at the kitchen to make sure no one saw her. She retrieved the cake and took a bite. A smile spread across her face, and, squinting, she gave a little wave. That evening, Angelique decided she would wait until Thais was asleep and slipped down to the kitchen. She hid part of her dinner in a cloth and lay awake until the stars were bright as fireflies and Thais was snoring. Angelique lifted the latch to her door and slipped into the stairway, glad that there was no moon. The girl was curled up under a huge chopping block in the dark kitchen. She woke the minute Angelique appeared at the door, sat up, rubbed her eyes and stared, knowing better than to make a sound. Chloe, Angelique whispered. The girl shrunk back against the wall. Don't be afraid. I only... Esprit! She hissed, eyes wide with fear. No, 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 I'm not a spirit, said Angelique softly, and I won't hurt you. Chloe pulled more into a ball and whispered harshly, Don't come near me. Suzette said I must never talk to you, or you will eat me. No, I only want to... Erzuli, touch me and I will die! Angelique hesitated, then sat down beside the chopping block a little apart from her. Opening her cloth, she took out a piece of pork and began to nibble. She could feel Chloe's eyes on her. She slid a piece of the meat over to Chloe. I brought you something. The girl hesitated, then snatched it up. Both ate without speaking, making little slurping noises, until each became aware of their vulgar sounds and began to giggle. Angelique, afraid they would be discovered, bit on her fingers to stop herself, and they shook, choking, trying to stifle their laughter. Your name is Chloe, isn't it? Angelique whispered. My mama call me Chloe, but Thais and Suzette call me Gal. I hates it, she whispered. What kind of name is Gal? Mine is Angelique. I know you. You lives in the tower. They sat in silence. How old are you? Angelique asked. I don't know, ten maybe. Stand up. Chloe rose warily. I think you're only nine, Angelique decided, but that's good, we can be friends, even though I am almost eleven. No, no, I can't be your friend, I can't play with you. Don't be silly. We'll meet at night when everyone is asleep. Don't you see? I have no one to talk to. What for you pick me? Chloe, I wished for a friend. I've been so lonely. Chloe smiled. I likes to meet a whole lot, she said softly. Good. I have to go back before Tyus wakes up. Oh, Lord, go in a hurry. I'll come back again tomorrow. I'll bring food, and you can bring me some mud. Mud? So we can make something. Angelique gave her a little hug and dashed back across the dark courtyard. The next night, Angelique and Chloe crept through the underground passageway to the little room behind the altar. Chloe brought clay from the riverbed. They lit a candle and whispered together for hours, making tiny cows, chickens, and goats. After that night, the room became their secret chamber. They created the whole plantation out of clay. They fashioned the tower and castle walls. Soon there were small slave figures planting cane. Angelique fished through her wardrobe and found wisps of lace and embroidery to decorate the little people. They made up stories and portrayed all the roles— overseer and planter, slave and child, moving the figures around when they spoke. Chloe seemed to carry none of the weight of her slave's existence. She was lively, and her enthusiasm for doll play was boundless. Get that slave out of here, she would hollow in the cruel voice of the overseer. No, master, don't put him in the ground, she would cry for the slave. Dig the hole and stick him in it, she would growl, burying her little figure up to his neck in dirt. Angelique could not imagine such cruel tortures. She thought Chloe invented these dramas, and she was in awe of the girl's imagination. 
It was Chloe's idea to make the dolls. One had the blonde hair of Angelique, and one had the little black braid of Chloe's, hair cut from their own heads. The clothing was ripped from their own dresses to make them more authentic. Eyes were tiny stones, and they argued over who would use the seed with the most perfect curve for a mouth. During the day, Angelique read from the book. She remembered many things from her mother's teachings, but she wanted to know more. One night, Angelique decided to try something from the book, but there were many things she needed she did not have. She asked Chloe, Can you get me a toad or a little frog? Why you want a toad? To make a spell, it has to be alive. When Chloe brought the toad, Angelique turned it on its back and stroked it until it was hypnotized. She took the smallest knife and opened its stomach. See? There's the heart. Which do you think is the liver? The what? We need the liver. We need to eat them both. What do you want to eat it for? Chloe cried. For courage and cunning. I ain't eating no frog's liver. You must. Angelique poked at the frog's insides. She pulled out a tiny, slick organ and offered it to Chloe, whose eyes grew wide with disgust. Angelique cut out the heart, and holding the two bloody bits and slicing them into two small pieces, she recited the words from the book. With a grimace, she swallowed her portion. Angelique offered Chloe her share, but she wriggled away, shrieking, I don't want that! We're going to do the spell now, Angelique said, but yours won't work because you didn't eat the heart. I don't want to. Let's begin. Angelique reached for Chloe's doll and breathed on its face. You are Chloe, she cooed, and you are alive. She looked over at Chloe. Do the same with mine. Chloe grabbed the doll with the yellow hair. You is Angelique and you is alive, she said without much enthusiasm. Angelique handed her a piece of string, tied around the throat. Why? It's the spell. Do it. Chloe fumbled with the string and made a slip knot. Now pull the string tight. You want it to choke you? If the spell works, of course. Chloe tightened the string, watching Angelique's face for any sign of choking. Tighter, Angelique frowned. Any tighter, it'll pull your head off. Chloe pulled the knot tighter, and just as she had predicted, the clay head of Angelique's doll toppled to the floor. Angelique sighed. I'm doing something wrong. What do you want to do spells for anyway? Spells is dangerous. Let me try it on your doll. I don't want to try it. Let's play something else. She threw down the doll, rising to her feet, but Angelique was determined and took the string and wrapped it around the neck of Chloe's doll. You are Chloe. You are alive. She began to chant softly, her hands still sticky from the frog's entrails and she wrapped the string around her fingers to get a better grip. Angelique began to pull, slowly, staring down at the little doll's pebble eyes, pouring all her force toward the little neck. Suddenly she felt a sizzling spasm, and then a ripple of heat. Fire curled in her belly, and her throat burned. Chloe stopped still. It working, she cried. It working now. Her eyes flew wide, and she reached for her neck and screamed. Angelique froze in disbelief, staring at Chloe, who was truly in pain, holding her neck with her hands and coughing. Stop it! Stop the spell! I can't breathe! Angelique tried to pull her hands away, but her fingers were tangled in the string. Chloe made a thin, screeching sound and gagged, tearing at her throat. Save me, she whispered, convulsed with a raw, hacking cough. Angelique dug frantically at the loop of the string. Chloe moaned, clawing at her neck, tears popping from her eyes. Angelique crawled to her knees, scratching the ground for the knife she had used on the frog. Her fingers found the blade and she grabbed the doll. Her hands shaking, she eased the knife under the string and jerked. Once it slipped, again it cut. Chloe fell over in a quivering heap, staring up at Angelique with anguished eyes, which slowly glassed over as she lost consciousness. Angelique dragged Chloe into her arms and held her close. Chloe, please, don't die, she sobbed. I didn't know it would work. Please wake up. But Chloe lay still, her body as limp as kelp. Angelique grew frantic. Another spell. 
There had to be one. Something. There was something. What was it? To revive a strangling beast? That was it? She struggled to remember the words. Different words. Christian words. They came to her in part, and then she remembered more, and she began to pray over Chloe's still form. God who was born. God who died. God who came to life again. Save her. Save her. She sobbed the words over and over, kissing Chloe's face, wet with her own tears and breathing into her mouth. You are Chloe. You are alive. There was a faint moan and Chloe opened her eyes. Angelique clasped her to her breast and wept hot tears of relief. Oh, Chloe, I'm so sorry. Please tell me you forgive me. Them spells is evil, whispered Chloe. She held Chloe while she slept, her thoughts spinning. The spell had worked so easily, and the force had entered her and ignited her energy. What was that power? Some of the rules in the book were correct. The doll with clothing that had touched Chloe's skin, Chloe's hair. There was something else. Chloe had died, and she had brought her back to life. That couldn't be possible. And yet, she felt exhilarated. This was the something her father had spoken of. But what did he really know about her? And what did she know of herself? It was dawn when the two girls crept back through the underground passageway. Chloe clung to Angelique, recovered but still frightened, her throat painfully sore. They emerged from the tunnel and they were ready to cross the courtyard when they heard horses approaching the gate to the main road. Angelique grabbed Chloe's hand. Hide! The two girls ducked behind the side of the chapel, just as Angelique's father and another gentleman planter rode into the central courtyard. She remembered his name. It was Louis de Salle. He had been there the day she had been chosen. The hooves of the restless horses rang on the stones, and the men spoke in low voices, thick with drink. I are Satan's whore, Bouchard. The whip is the music of the Negro. The whip alone will make him work. No, they must have their dancing. They are obsessed with her. I can barely keep their hands away. What do you mean? I forget that I am there, and sometimes I must pull out the sword. But they know in their cunning brains what is coming, and they will wait. <laughs> he laughed bitterly. Angelique and Chloe hovered in the shadow of the wall. The sun was rising, and a long shaft of light crossed the courtyard. They were afraid to move and could only cower against the stones. All the courtyard lay between them and the kitchen. De Salles continued in slurred words. They are morally unfit. Last week, Valentine threw himself into the big vat, just as it came to a boil, the bloody fool. And they use any means to take vengeance. I was flogging a slave, and the madman swallowed his own tongue, choked to death. Bouchard's horse clipped toward the chapel, and the girls hugged the wall. Chloe stared at Angelique with frightened eyes. My worst nightmare, Bouchard was saying. I have to re-rig the blasted windmill. The new grinders haven't arrived yet. If the cane comes in early, I shall lose it all. The horse's hoofs came nearer. See what a bind I'm in? Come Sunday, I'll give them their damned ceremony, and then... His voice was syrupy with rum. There's Zuli, my little treasure hidden away. What would I do without her, Louise? Angelique felt Chloe tugging at her sleeve. She turned to see the face of her friend contorted in a grimace as she motioned to her throat. Angelique instantly seized her by the head and buried it in her skirt, but Chloe exploded in a spasm of muffled coughs. Bouchard barked in their direction. Who's there? Angelique and Chloe quickly scurried around the back of the building. The hooves rang on the stones as the animal approached, stopped and clipped again, more slowly. There was an agonizing wait until Angelique's father was staring down at the two quivering girls. What is this? he growled. What in hell are you doing out here? You are forbidden to show yourself. His tone was withering with contempt. And to a slave. Please, Father, don't harm her. She's my friend. 
friend. She'll betray us. She would never do that. Why are you here together at this time of morning? You stole away in the night. Yes, but no one saw us, no one. Why did you run off? Only to, to play. Play what? Where? Games father make believe in the little room beneath the chapel. Her father's face turned purple with fury. He snatched Chloe by the hair. She howled as he threw her across his shoulder and strode to the kitchen. DeSalle sat frozen upon his horse, gazing at the scene in stupefaction. Theodore, don't harm her belly. You want her to breed someday. Angelique ran to the kitchen door in time to see her father with Chloe under his arm. Her arms and legs flailing, he reached for a pair of coal tongs that hung on the wall, and brandishing the tool, he called out, Luis, hold her head! Angelique grabbed her father's coat. Father, don't hurt her, please. She's done nothing. I'll die if you hurt her. Her father turned and glared at her. You will die if I don't, he hissed. You heedless, reckless girl. Don't you know what you have done? She leapt upon him, clawing for the hand that held the tongs, but he flung her away. Chloe screeched at the top of her lungs, and Angelique, her head reeling from the blow, scrambled to her feet, only to feel DeSalle's grip on her arm. Her father yelled for the servant, trying in vain to hold Chloe down. Thais, come down here at once, blast your lazy black-eyed! He tried to still the wriggling girl. DeSalle's had both Angelique's arms held in his wrenching grip. Her father set the pliers on the chopping block and, grasping Chloe by the hair, held her flat against the scarred wood, prying at her mouth as she mewed and struggled. Thais appeared, witless with terror, at the door of the tower. Thais, help me. I will pull out her tongue. She'll never speak again. Let me go. Angelique found her captor's crotch with a kick, and he doubled over in agony. From the corner of her eye, she saw her father lift the dreaded pliers, and she flung herself on his arm again. Off me, you hellish creature, he cried. But both she and Chloe, now like wild hyenas, bit down. Chloe on the fingers pinching her tongue, and Angelique on the side of the fist that held the tongs. Angelique felt her teeth sink in the flesh, and the warm blood leak into her mouth. But like a rabid dog, she held on, even as blows smashed her head and she heard the pliers rattle to the ground. Then her father, dragging both attackers like a bull beleaguered by lion cubs, lumbered into the courtyard. He shook Angelique off with a kick, and she fell to the earth, rolled and lifted her head to see him lurch for the well at the center of the courtyard, Chloe still under his arm. She knew what he was going to do. No, she screamed, no! And stumbling, desperate to stop him, she grabbed for his leg, his arm, but too late as he lifted the howling girl above his head and hurled her over the edge. Angelique slammed into the well wall, reaching, screaming, Chloe! and stared down into the gaping hole. She heard a thin wail and felt the chain vibrate as though struck, and she screamed, her cries resonating with the falling girls, echoing in the cavern, and then silence. Thais could not console the grieving Angelique, who sat clinging to her window, her tears falling freely, staring at the forsaken well, as though she could draw Chloe like water back from the dead. She was numb with anger and despair, and her only thoughts were now of her mother, that hers was the only embrace that would lift this crushing pain. It was late afternoon when a cart came through the gate and stopped by the well. A muscular man in leather descended from the cart with a young slave boy at his side. After looking into the well, and after much muttering, the man pulled a rope from the cart and tied it around the boy's waist. The boy then climbed upon the bucket his bare feet curled around the edge, and the man proceeded to lower him down into the chasm. Feeble hope fluttered near Angelique's heart, but there was no sound or movement from the dark hole. At last the chain gave a rattle, and the man leaned in and tugged on the rope, hauling the boy back up. He was dripping wet as he climbed out and jumped to the ground. Then the two looked in as the man raised the bucket, the pulley creaking as it turned. When the bucket broke the air, it bore Chloe's limp form draped across the rim. The man swung her off, tossed her to the earth as though she were a sack of feed. Angelique turned to Thais. Please, Thais, let me go down, she urged. I need to see her, to say goodbye. But shaking her head, Thais rose and moved for the door. No, Missy, you stay here. 
like you should have done all along. Angelique turned back to the window. She remembered Suzette, who had fallen on the same spot, beaten but alive. Chloe lay on the stone she had washed so many times, her face hidden under her arm, the ragged dress clinging to her delicate form. Angelique watched as Thais and Suzette silently wrapped the body and carried it into the kitchen. The man spoke to them and Thais nodded. Suddenly it occurred to Angelique that the man was not a servant and did not live on the plantation. His leather jerkin marked him as a journeyman who had been called to save the well, someone perhaps from St. Pierre. The man turned and followed the slave women into the kitchen. Without thinking, Angelique dashed into the courtyard, ignoring the slave boy who stared in astonishment when she appeared. He made no sound and no move to stop her as she raced to the cart and dropped into the back. She saw in a flash that it was a sailmaker's wagon, for canvas and ropes lay about in piles. She burrowed under them, tucking herself into a corner. She waited, afraid to breathe, for agonizing minutes, certain her absence would be discovered, until, finally, she felt the cart's wheels begin to turn. At last, they were on the road. The horse took off, towards where she did not know or care, as long as she was free. Her heart quickened at the thought of what might lie ahead, her reunion with her mother, the safety and love of her childhood and the sea. The pain of Chloe's death and the exhilaration of her escape gathered around her like phantoms. Troubled, she fought sleep, but finally succumbed and fell into a dark well, clawing at the cold walls as she slid into unconsciousness. She dreamed of Barnabas. The curtain opened, light poured in, and he was there, laughing, climbing in beside her. He spilled the jewels into her lap and took them up again, his fingers carelessly brushing her legs as he gathered the baubles from the folds of her dress. Then he kissed her and was so close that she felt the beating of both their hearts. He whispered to her, Goddess. She woke in the dead of night. Someone was shaking her, and she sat up with a start. The cart was still, parked in an empty shed, and the slave boy stood over her, peering down. What you want, girl? He whispered. Where are we? She said, sitting up. We's home. Master's in the house, and he leave me to call them ropes. Home? Where's that? We's in St. Pierre. We brung you the whole way. What you going to do now? Did anybody see me? I didn't tell nobody you was there. I didn't say a word to nobody. I knew you was trying to escape. I have to go. She climbed out of the cart. I'm going to find my mother. I know the way from here. You ain't scared to go alone? Why should I be? I don't know. I guess nothing would scare you. The way you jump in that wagon, you run like a pig. You run for your life. There'd be bad things on the road. Robbers and buckaroons. I just put these ropes away and I'll come with you for a bit. I don't want to wait for you. There's no moon and no one will see me. And with that, she scampered towards the dock, but the boy was fast on her heels. Trouble is, he said breathlessly, they sees a white gal with a black boy and I'd be in big trouble. So as I just hang back a little bit, you go on ahead, but you don't worry, I'd be following right after. The boy spoke not another word for over half an hour as they trudged along the road in the darkness. Several times she tried to lose him, but finally she let him be, and he stayed with her as though she had tethered him on a line. The night was warm. The music of the rolling surf was a siren song. Angelique ran to the edge of the foam and saw the stars themselves swimming in the inky waves. What are you doing? the boy called. She ignored him and plunged into the water, at home now, for the sea was her soul's birthplace. When she crawled out on the sand, breathless and exhilarated, the boy was waiting for her. You swim like a porpoise, was all he said. Do you have a name? she asked as she sat down near him. Cesar, came the reply. And I suppose you are the sailmaker's slave? I ain't no slave. I got my papers. You're free? She felt an odd pang of envy. Yes, miss. Master give me my freedom. I earned it so in sail. I've been busting my fingers for ten years. Made a hundred sail. Then you were still indentured, she smirked. Just as I thought. You aren't free. Well, that's sure what you don't know. 
I've been to sea already as a sailmaker's mate. And someday I'd be traveling home to Africa. Africa? <laughs> what fine dreams you have. I come over when I was a baby, but I'd be going back before the mast. You wait and see. I made that sail you was hiding under. You go to a ship in the harbor tomorrow, a schooner from America. America? cried Angelique. Is the ship from Maine, do you think? It's an interloper, come to trade tobacco for rum and guns, and it take on illegal slaves. Oh, I don't believe you made a sail for that schooner, she said, or you would know whether it came from Maine. Everything you said just now was probably a lie. She rose and began walking again, following the path around the lagoon. Cesar had given up hanging behind her and now walked beside her. All they could see was the sea's glimmering foam, the long pale road, and the dunes rising to the jungle. What make you so bitter? That's none of your affair, she said hotly. Why are you watching me? You was running away? Yes, so, what from? She thought to tell him, but then couldn't answer. The harsh lesson of secrecy was driven too deep. Why was you there at that castle? It belongs to my father, Theodore Bouchard. Did you know the girl who drowned? She was my friend. Why did she throw herself in the well? But she didn't. Monsieur Bouchard said the goddess Serzuli drove her to do it. No, that's not how it was at all. That shows how stupid you are to believe such a thing. Her heart skipped a beat. Back down the road, a horse was coming at full gallop. Cesar grabbed her arm and pulled her into the ditch beside the path. They lay, breathing in the dark, waiting as the hoofbeats thundered by their heads into the distance. Finally, Cesar whispered, He gone now? He didn't see nothing. She sighed and let the fear flow out of her. How much more to your home? He said. I don't know. It can't be far. You should wait till morning. Then there'll be people on the road coming and going. And you won't be so suspicious looking. I could sleep a bit, couldn't you? I'm not tired, she said dreamily. There was a long pause. Has you been with a boy yet? He asked softly. What do you mean, been with? Well, I means alone. She was about to say, like this... But her pride stopped her, and she remembered the night Barnabas had climbed into her covered chaise. Yes, once. Only once? They lay in the grasses and looked up at the glittering stars. Thank you, Cesar, for not giving me up. I think you is a brave girl, answered the boy. You seize your chance and you grabbed it. Is your mama learn you that? I don't know. Well... That brave heart, it'll give you fortune, give you pain. Angelique heard these words as she drifted off to sleep. And with Cesar there with her, she felt safe for the first time in a long time. When she woke, the boy was shaking her. I got to go now, before I was found out. Can you find the way? She sat up. Dawn streaked the sky and the sea rolled in on the golden sand. I see the cottage, she cried, scrambling to her feet. Thank you, Cesar. She threw her arms around his neck and kissed his cheek. You've brought me home. They saw one another clearly for the first time in the morning light. He was coal black and spoke in a shaking voice. Tell me your name. I want to think of you when I was gone to see. It's Angelique. Goodbye, Angelique, and good luck. He turned and started back up the road toward Saint-Pierre. She worried about the late night rider. Could it have been her father? But as she came round the curve of the beach, she saw no horse. Her heart began beating with exultation as she imagined her mother's face, hearing her cry of happiness, feeling her cheek against her bosom. Never would she leave her again. But as she drew closer, she felt a stab of dismay. The lustrous banana trees were hanging limp and the garden had dried to bare earth. The once coral house was now pale as the sand it stood upon and the lavender shutters had fallen away. The thatch of the roof was flattened and gray and the door stood open to a deserted room. 
She wandered inside and stood a moment in the room that seemed so small now, dusty and abandoned. Mama? She cried, unable to comprehend this. Mama? She walked to the back door and pushed it open. A horse snorted, and she heard the thud of a hoof in the dirt. The animal was tethered to a broken banana frond. When he saw her, he lifted his head and stared. She froze as her father staggered out of the trees. He blinked at her momentarily, and then his drunken brain seemed to grasp that she was really there. Run away from me, will you? His voice was hoarse. I'll have your skin off your bones. He took a lurching step forward. For a moment she thought she would faint and made a helpless motion with her arms, but he sprang for her before she could cry out and pressed her to him, smothering her face in his shirt. Why do you despise me? he cried, rum slurring his speech. Betray me, defy me, do you want to kill me? He wrenched and dug his fingers into her neck, pushing her down. She cried out in terror. Then she heard his belt sing in the air, and as the hot flash seared her back, she saw Chloe as she plunged into blackness, and the next blow came just before the dark water swallowed her up. She was dressed in the white gown for the ceremony. It was almost time for her to appear. As she walked into the room behind the altar, Angelique was surprised to see that after all these months, the clay figures were still there where they had left them. The Angelique doll was lying headless on the floor. She stared at the toys but felt nothing. It seemed strange now that she had ever played such a silly game. What you doing? The servant had asked, suspicious. Sit down. No, Angelique spat. Don't tell me what to do. She smashed the toys with her foot, kicking them aside. The drumming flooded the chapel, summoning the spirits. Go on, it's time, said Suzette. Sullenly, Angelique climbed under the curtain. Her mind was brittle tonight and bored by the ceremony. She watched coldly, impassively, thinking to expose its secrets. Instantly, the drums came to life, bright and palpitating. The bodies of the dancing slaves were coated with thick white paste, their dark skin gleaming through pale streaks. A fire smoldered at the foot of her platform. The smoke rose to her nostrils. Then she heard a terrified squawking above the sound of the pulsing drums, and a dancer leapt forward, his dead eyes staring. Angelique listened closely, trying to understand his babbling. All the loas were listed in the book, and she wondered if she could recognize which one had claimed him, raving its gibberish. She watched him with cold fascination, trying to decide whether he was putting on a show or if he were truly taken. As he drew nearer to her and she saw the blood stream over his glistening forehead, his lips did not move, but she heard him whisper, Chloe, Chloe, Chloe. A sigh passed through the other worshippers. They backed away and their fear was palpable. He swayed and reached for her, croaking, his face an eyeless mask, his long fingers grazing her legs, and even as she shrank back from his touch, she felt a tingle through her body. Suddenly he quivered and sprang up on her altar, and the drums rumbled, echoing, fading. He leaned over her with his eyes still blind, and flames flew from his lips. But as she recoiled, she felt that the flames were cool, like ribbons, enveloping her in waves of crimson and gold. They were leaves, petals, in such masses that she thought she would drown in the tumbling blossoms. She laughed and gathered the petals, tossing them like rain into the air. They floated down on the worshippers, now passive and staring, each face beautiful and elegant. The drums entered her body, and she began to dance, first as a child in play, and then more sensually, dancing on the loose fabric of her gown, naked before them. The spirit entered her, enfolding her in a glowing mist. Erzuli sang strange songs from her mouth and quivered as Angelique fell, trembling in the power of the loa. One by one, the worshippers touched her, kissed her, their lips brushing her arched feet. She screamed like a child, tears streaming from her eyes, her body in torment. They murmured solace and whispered among themselves, and they stroked her until she slept. When she emerged from her trance, 
she had lost all memory of her position. The next morning, Angelique sat by her window, staring across the courtyard. So, the spirits were real. She had never doubted it, but now she longed to know more. She felt a kinship with the slaves and envied their easy access to the gods. As, like them, a prisoner of violence and fear, she turned inward for escape. After that day, the ceremony became her obsession. For long hours, she recited the incantation softly to herself, poring over the book, struggling to decipher the spells. The pages revealed secrets of ancient African magic, which Angelique studied intently. She dreaded her father's presence, and often woke in the night when the creaking of the windmill invaded her dreams, like the voice of a demon. After bringing her back to the plantation, he had ignored her, except during the ceremony. She hoped that as long as she performed her duties as a goddess, he would leave her alone. She sensed how valuable she was to him and the other planters, who had begun in secrecy to toy with African voodoo. On Sundays they worshipped at church, but at midnight they came to the dancing. One day she heard a man's voice on the stair, and she felt a jolt of fear, thinking it was her father. When the door opened, she was surprised to see a stranger. It was the priest, Father Lebrot, who had spoken to her after the trial with the dogs. Angelique, he said kindly, may, may, may I come in? She stared at him, dumbfounded. He seemed an emissary from another world. He nodded to Tice to leave them. He was a rotund man with a fleshy neck bulging over his collar. His jovial smile could not hide his self-importance. How are you, my dear? I've been wondering how you were s s sustaining your ordeal. The use of the word ordeal angered her, and she was instantly suspicious. It is not an ordeal to be your Zuli, she glowered. He sighed and motioned for her to sit, and she felt him searching her face for traces of sorrow. I have great concern for your immortal soul, my child. You are participating in rituals which are the work of the devil. She gasped. I have not seen the devil. These false gods, the sacrifices, you must know. That is the devil's doing. I know no such thing. You think the devil is everywhere. P -p Pray with me. I don't want to pray, she answered petulantly. He looked surprised, but then his face softened. Of course you don't. How foolish of me. You say your prayers with the slaves. Tell me, my dear, are their prayers answered? What was the nature of their prayers, she wondered. Did the slaves pray for freedom? They asked for nothing, only life and ecstasy, a chance to lose themselves in the dancing. They pray to me she decided. He looked befuddled, and she felt pleased. And the planters pray to me as well, she added arrogantly. She saw his gaze flicker, as though she had confirmed a suspicion he held. The planters come to these dances, he asked. Sometimes. Erzuli grants wishes if she chooses. He rose and began to pace. Angelique could see the sweat in the folds of his neck. She thought his robes must be uncomfortable in the heat. The planters who come to these rituals are as ignorant as the s s slaves. They turn to these primitive ceremonies out of s desperation. They know Erzuli will give them something God will not. The priest placed his folded arms under his round belly. Child, how little you understand. God's great gift is life everlasting. For those who have faith, the treasures await in heaven. These greedy men crossed the sea because others before them had made fortunes and sugar. They thought they would live like kings here. Angelique watched the sweat drip down his face. She understood him perfectly. He was afraid of the Negroes, like all white men. The planters fear the slaves and need them, both their sweat and their heathen superstitions. Without workers, they are helpless. So black men swarm these islands, their numbers growing every day. He was becoming impassioned and amazingly had lost his stutter. And still they want more. They bring the poor creatures in ships of doom, and the blacks will not work, so they beat them to death and bring more. Already these misguided whites are outnumbered thirty to one. In the end, God will not own these islands. They will belong to the Negro. 
It is the devil's plan. He has planted the greed in the wide man's heart. He stopped out of breath, his eyes bulging. Then he regained his composure. Child, you are in danger, he urged, from the ceremony. So, he was threatened by the voodoo rituals. He had come to frighten her because he was afraid. There is no danger. My father protects me. Your father, he frowned. Who is your father? Monsieur Bouchard. The priests seemed astounded. I, I, I didn't realize that Theodore... Th that you were his daughter? He threw his arms to the sky. Lord, preserve us. With that, he hurried to leave. He turned to her at the door. I'll be back to see you. Think about what I've said, he pleaded. Every morning when the bell sounded, Angelique rose to watch the slaves drag their tired bodies to the field, slaves who had sometimes worshipped her the night before. She had thought about Father Lebro, and was ashamed of her haughtiness. Never did she really believe that she was the source of the power. She knew it would have been the same without her. She was transformed by the slaves' adoration. The magic they evoked sprung from within them. The goddess of love floated in the air, longing to be called. Angelique began to yearn for Erzuli. She began to plan her invocation, simple and imploring. She only wanted the goddess within her once more. She waited until Thais was asleep, then crept down into the courtyard, and under a sky without stars she lit candles. She had a prize, a white pigeon she had trapped at her window with weeks of crumbs. She stroked him gently and spoke softly. Come, little dove, don't be afraid. She tightened her grip around him, and now she had him ready for Erzuli. She looked at his quick, darting head, and she felt the life within him quivering. She hoped this would be enough. She took a knife and pierced the throat of the bird, and while it thrashed, let its blood flow into a cup. She began to chant softly, Erzuli, Erzuli. Closing her eyes and shivering, she stood and drank the blood. She cried, Goddess, Erzuli, I call thee from within the thunder's rumbling. I beseech you, enter me. She fell to her knees and waited, her head bowed. She felt weak and unprepared, then wholly unworthy. And all at once her body began to tremble with tingling heat, her mind fixed on the image of a tiny spark that grew and flared into swarms of color, dancing around her in splintered rainbows. There was a humming sound, alive and breathing, and its fingers caressed her, singing, moaning, mist filled the courtyard, and voices whined like wind, dissonant, eerie. And there was a figure, human, but not Erzuli, that wavered in the gloom, a man-shape, sinewy, flickering like a flame, with a face as smooth as alabaster. Ebony hair fell across his forehead, and he was standing in a heaving chariot, where floating before him, in tumbling waves of darkness, were velvet horses, dark and muscular as the midnight sea. Who are you? Why have you come? You called. You dragged me from my centuries of sleep. I didn't call you. You are still a child, Angelique. Too young. I see your flowering talent. Long to capture it and draw it into my world. I won't do it. Not yet. Not yet. Who are you? You don't remember. No. I did not call you, and I don't want you here. Oh, come with me, Angelique. Let me touch you. Feel you. Don't touch me. I don't want you. I never wanted you. I will never leave you. And you are still too young to choose. But remember, I am there. And I alone protect you. That's not true. I alone love you. I've always loved you. I will never desert you. Never. Never. After that night, Angelique lost her passion for the ceremony. Dread 
permeated her mind, and she no longer craved Erzuli. She was unresponsive on the platform, and the moaning of the slaves gave her neither terror nor joy. All day she feared her father might come to her, and every night she slept fitfully, imagining the return of the mysterious dark spirit. She woke one morning to find Thais standing on one window seat, pulling the heavy curtains closed. Why are you doing that? she asked. I like the sunlight. Time to cut the cane, Thais said. We gots to move you out of the tower. Slaves coming to mend the windmill. Massa say you gots to stay hidden. Don't you go near the window now, you hear? Did you say I'm leaving? Yeah, to that place you've been wondering about. Massa say put her in the bedroom on the third floor. The plantation house? A shiver ran through her. Being anywhere close to her father was her deepest fear. Tai sensed her uneasiness. But not today. Too many people running around. We goes tomorrow. So you gather up what you want to take with you. Later in the day, Angelique heard shouting in the courtyard, and with Tais nowhere in sight, she crept to the window and peered out. There was commotion as slaves unloaded a huge set of wooden wheels beside the tower. Her father directed the slaves to carry them inside. Suddenly she felt vibrations inside the tower and realized the huge post in the center of her room was turning. It slowly revolved, jarring the structure like an earthquake. Outside she could hear slaves climbing on the windmill, hammering, and one of the enormous fans swung over the window, blotting out the sunlight. Through the fabric she saw the slender figure of a young boy. He was stretching a new sheet of canvas over the vein. Angelique was admiring his agility, and then she realized it was Cesar. He was clinging to the frame like a tree frog, oblivious of the height, deftly tying off a piece of rope. Cesar, she called. He looked around. Here, at the window. He swung closer to the tower and propped a foot against the stone, peering in. His face lit up. Angelique, is that you? I didn't escape, she sighed. Shall I come inside? No, she whispered. Away from the window. No one is supposed to know I'm here. He frowned. You mean you are a... a prisoner? His face clouded. He shifted his position on the wall, trying to get closer. He grabbed the window bars and hung precariously. She began to feel frightened. Please, leave me, Cesar, before someone sees you. My father is a ruthless man. A harsh voice rang out from the courtyard, and Cesar quickly kicked himself back from the wall and, clinging to the arm, rode it down to the ground. He ran for a cart and pulled loose another piece of canvas. He looked up at her window, winked at her, then moved away. Late that night, she heard a sound outside. Cesar had climbed upon the vein and was tapping on the shutter. Thais was sleeping, but Angelique was afraid to risk a conversation. So she made a motion to him that she would go down, and she ran for the stairs. Seconds later, she was in the courtyard. Cesar? Here. She looked toward the edge of the flagstones where the wall fell to the sea. He was sitting on the low balustrade. She ran to the edge of the parapet and sank to the ground at his side. I mustn't stay. It's dangerous. Look. Cesar pointed to the small inlet directly beneath them. The night was warm and hazy, and she realized she could look out over the expanse of the sea. A long peninsula curved around, hugging the lagoon. Dare be your schooner from Maine. She could make out a boat at anchor with tiny lights gleaming like stars. Are you sure, she asked. I know all the boats. None of them get by me. Why is it here? Why isn't it in the harbor in St. Pierre? Because she'd be hidden away. This little bay make a good anchor to wait for morning. She drew the passage and now she take out across the sea with the morning tide. I wish I were on that boat. You would not want to be aboard her. She is a stolen bark. And though she move like a guileless girl, she is a whore. Why is that? Because she carries slaves. Angelique walked to the edge and looked down. I wouldn't care. A slave is what I am. Gal, you don't know what you say. Someday you leave here. My father won't let me go. And besides, I have nowhere to go. I don't know what happened to my mother or where she is. She looked at Cesar's frowning face. And, and I can't talk to anyone, she said, sinking down again. 
her heart aching as she looked behind her. If my father found us like this, she shivered. Do you remember the girl in the well? Cesar nodded. Her name was Chloe. We played together in secret. My father found us one night and... She rose suddenly. I can't stay here any longer, Cesar. I should not have come down. Wait. I have something to tell you. You know what is coming. Listen. Far off she could hear drums. A night without drums was rare. The drums of rebellion. Escaped slaves hiding in the mountains. They sneak down at night and they tell the slaves, Rebel! Find freedom! Freedom? She loved the word, the most beautiful word she knew. When rebellion come, all the blanks be killed. They burn the buildings to the ground. That's what I come to tell you. Listen. Dem's Igbo drums. Your father's slaves all be Igbo. Angelique remembered Chloe, her copper skin and golden green eyes. They be melancholy people, feel desolate so far from home. In Africa, they are cannibals. She shuddered and he laughed at her fright, his teeth white in the moonlight. Are you Ipo? Nah, gal. Then you don't know those drums. I know enough. Listen to me. It's their history. They rise up one night and they set the fires. When the time comes, I let you know. Then you can warn your father. Warn him? She caught her breath. I will never warn him. I hope the slaves burn the plantation. What? He was dumbfounded. And leave him dead. Goodbye, Cesar, she cried, backing away as she turned and ran back to the tower. When Angelique woke the next morning, she did not know where she was. Then she remembered. Thais had woken her in the early hours, moved her to the plantation house, and locked her in a third-floor room. Angelique looked around at her new surroundings, a bed, a dresser, and bare floors. She ran to one of the small windows and looked across at the tower. There was great activity in the courtyard, with many slaves at work. Her father was storming about, cursing and pointing towards the tower. She was amazed to see that the windmill was turning and that the doors of the crushing room were thrown open. Slaves were easing the rollers into place. Suddenly one of the men gave a cry, and several workers inside her tower room bellowed in response. The windmill shuddered under the load, and the great rollers beneath it began to revolve. A cheer rang out. Even her father seemed relieved as he stood watching the crushers grind. The thought of seeing her father face to face now that she was living nearer to him made her shiver with fear. She wondered when the next ceremony would be, and suddenly thought she should take from the secret room whatever she might need to protect her. Angelique began to wonder whether anyone would come for her. She had no clothing other than what she was wearing, and no one had brought her food. She went to the door, tried the bolt, and to her surprise found it crude and easily forced. At once she heard cries from the courtyard, and she ran back to see two ox carts lumbering through the gate, laden with cane. Slaves unloaded the grasses, then carried them to the crusher, forcing them between the rollers. She glanced at the sky, where a plume of dark smoke rose from the stack. Through the windows of the curing house, she could see flames reflected in huge copper kettles. In the excitement of harvesting the cane, she had been completely forgotten. Late that evening, Thais appeared with food. She was exhausted, her clothes were filthy, and she collapsed wearily upon a small stool. Thais, what's happened to you? Angelique asked. I be made to cut cane, child, and it destroy me. She held up her hands, swollen with bloody welts. Angelique gasped. Why must you go to the field? You're supposed to care for me. We's all walking before the whip now. Tyus looked at Angelique with sorrowful eyes. Angelique realized the demands of the harvest would consume the time and energy of everyone on the plantation. Before long, she began to explore the empty mansion. The castle had once known grandeur. There were parquet floors, stained glass windows, and in some of the rooms, great tapestries hung on the walls. Compared to the gloom of the castle, the courtyard swarmed with life. From dawn till midnight, the slaves toiled. The crushers screamed and clattered. The windmill groaned, and the tall smokestack spewed noxious gases into the air. Thais proved too old for the field and was stationed at the fires. She would come into Angelique's room, dragging her feet with weariness. One evening she moved so slowly 
that Angelique looked at her with concern. Taish, something wrong? The poor slave woman began to weep. He beat me, she whispered. Taos pulled away her shirt to show her back, crisscrossed with bloody stripes. Why would he do that? They call the order to strike, but it's too late. The syrup turned hard as a rock and is lost. I say do it now, but the man in charge, the Zare, he say no. The foam gets so high it boil and overflow from the vat. Lazir burned and must have beat me for ruined the batch. Angelique felt a pity beyond words. She sat beside Tice, laying her head in her lap. Poor Tice, I am so sorry. Father is a vicious man. A thought flashed across her mind. Do you know, there is a rebellion in the air. Tice sighed, no child, no rebellion. Slaves rebel, they be hanged or shot. When the slaves rise up over Trinity Way, they call in the militia. No pride against guns. I'll be dead now, twenty brave slaves massacred. But the drums, don't you know what they say? I heard them again last night. Mm. Drums sing like Pelly mutters, big talk, no explosion. Child, the slaves be doomed to labor to death. One morning, Angelique heard her father ride out the gate on horseback, and wondering why the day was so still, she ran to see that the mill was shut down, the veins turning slowly in the windless air. Slaves sat about, exhausted and morose. She decided to seize the opportunity to wander through the castle, and after an hour or so of searching, found herself outside her father's chambers. She pushed open the heavy door. She saw a large, dark room with a huge canopy bed. Rumpled sheets were strewn upon the mattress. A chair was buried in filthy clothing. She recognized the foul-smelling coat her father wore, slung over the back. The desk was covered with papers. She glanced through the letters, harboring some faint hope of finding her mother's whereabouts. But there was nothing. One short note complained. Sugar not selling. Suggest you retain molasses for rum. Another, signed by her father, requested patience, saying the cane is too old and shows little juice, or workers still don't have the hang of it. She continued to search but found no word of her mother, only the lonely miseries of a man in the sugar trade. The terror soon began. For days, the slaves worked all night feeding cane to the crushers. Angelique woke to screams and ran to the window to hear slaves cry out, Stop the mill! They ran towards a lone man who was flailing with one arm while the other was caught between the cylinders. He must have fallen asleep at his post, she thought. Her father staggered out into the courtyard, cursing. What happened? Why the devil did he do that? Master, he caught. We got to open the rollers. I won't have the mill shut down. Keep going, you wretched imbeciles. Find an axe. Cut it off. The windmill thundered and the crushers whined as the slave bellowed. She saw the axe rise and fall and the bloody stump whip upwards and jab the air before the agonized man gathered his maimed arm to his breast and fell to his knees crying. After that night, Angelique could sense the slaves change. They were sullen and restless. The overseer beat them, but the force had drained from them. The drums began again, early in the morning, when the sky was still dark. Every morning after that, they throbbed before dawn. The night came when her father and the other planters tore into the courtyard on horseback. They went into a room behind the curing house and came out with muskets, shouting to one another, their voices crazed. Ah, they've killed them all! Wife and three daughters! A clattering of hooves, and they were off, thundering down the road. Angelique woke to a low whistle and ran to the window. Cesar was standing alone in the courtyard, lit by the fires from the boilers. Angelique, come down. I can't, I daren't. Your father be at the next plantation, seeking vengeance. I must talk to you. A few moments later, she crept out into the night. It was the first time she had been close to the threshers, and she was staggered by the size and noise of the machine. 
Weary slaves fed the unwieldy stalks into the cylinders, and juice trickled out into the curing house. In here, Cesar shouted, and dragged her towards the boiling room. Thais was leaning over a great copper kettle, stirring the syrup, so numb from fatigue that she never raised her head. The air dripped with steam. Cesar pulled Angelique to the far corner. Rebellion is coming! His eyes were wild. My father has gone off to join the militia. He came back for muskets. Oh, that is nothing, he said. The foolish slaves at San Marie plan to take over the plantation there. They'd be crazed with hatred. They will pay with their lives. Oh, will they all die? All. Still, it is a lucky ruse. The soldiers will massacre them and think they have smothered the fire. Then there... there is to be no rebellion. Ah, gal. Maroons and the hills be arming slaves all over the island. Plot rumble deep, like fire at Pele's heart. Tomorrow, at midnight, they set fire to Saint Pierre. Hundreds, thousands maybe kill all the Grand Blancs. It be the time for the black man. Will they come here? You're doomed, gal. Unless your father rouse his slaves to defend it. You think they fight for him? Never. He treats them like animals. Then this plantation, too, will fall. You must warn him. Never. <laughs> Listen, he said patiently. There is a path down to the bay, and I will have a boat waiting there for you. You'll be safe. Won't it be dangerous? Gal, I'm telling you this because I don't want to see you come to no harm. Them crazy slaves will rape you and kill you. You must warn your father, no matter how much you hate him. You don't want to see him die, do you? She didn't answer, but she thought perhaps he was right. I'll wait for you tomorrow night, he said. Don't be afraid. It did not seem possible for Angelique to fall asleep after this terrifying news. But somehow she drifted into a dreamless slumber. She woke to see her father's shadow standing over her. His smile was lecherous and his breath reeked of rum. Clumsily he reached for her and she shrank back from his grasp. He laughed, his legs spread wide. Hey, get up, Dolly! What do you want? Your old father is a grand fighter and you should be proud. Proud to be his daughter. Look in my hands and tell me what you see. He smirked with self-satisfaction. It's death, girl. Human death. Don't touch me, she begged. Angel, why do you hate me? Haven't I been good to you? She didn't answer. Waves of hatred flowed through her. I saved your life tonight. Those bastards were coming for you and I stopped them. Wrung their necks with my bare hands. God, to kill a man. Feel his heart stop. Stop beneath your fist. He stared at his hands in wonder. Give me a kiss for my pains. He moved towards her. Stay away. Her voice hissed so deadly it stopped him cold. By God, I like that temper. It sets me afire. Give me a battle, my pretty. I want to feel your struggle. He lunged and pulled her against him, burying his face in her hair. She lashed out, clawing for his eyes, and surprised, he fell back. He drew back his hand and struck her sharply across the face. She fell with a cry, her head reeling. Treacherous bitch! You'll have to do more than that to stop me! I don't have to stop you. Even if you kill me, you will not see the light of morning two days from now. You think you've won the battle at San Marie, but you are a fool. They are coming. Thousands of them. Tomorrow night, they will burn this plantation to the ground and you with it. I shall see you in the fires of hell. He gaped at her. Who told you this? Cesar, the sailmaker's boy. How did you talk to him? She knew she had him now. I listened at the window. He told the slaves that if they would not defend you, you were doomed. You heard all that? The liquor drained from his face. Tomorrow night, the slaves will burn Saint Pierre. It gave her satisfaction to see her father's face blanch at her words.
The next morning, the slaves were not at their posts. The courtyard was deserted, and she could hear music coming from the huts. She knew her father had given the workers a free day. Thais brought her breakfast, then sat on her stool, shaking her head in sorrow. Last night be bad, her voice was low. I know, Angelique answered. San Marie. So much bloodshed. We just find strength to fight back, and we be cut down by the soldiers. Don't you know what's happening tonight? I know tonight there'd be a ceremony. Angelique was jolted. Not tonight. Yes. Mass arrived off early this morning. He told me to make you perfect. I fetched a white gown. I won't do it. Tell him if he says I must pretend to be Erzuli again, I will go outside and show myself to them all. I'll tell them it's a lie. Ty's mouth fell open. Then she rose and scurried to the door, locking it behind her. Angelique wondered if there really would be a revolt. If she went to the schooner, would she ever come back here? She wondered if she should have told her father the plan. She had a sudden longing to return to the room behind the altar. She saw the grounds were deserted. Even Thais had disappeared. She eased the lock and dashed down the stairs. Once in the room, she realized that it had been months since she had performed the failed ritual to call up Erzuli, and it seemed strange to feel the familiar pulse quiver through her fingers. As she sifted through the paraphernalia on the dusty shelves, deep within her she felt that something had changed. Objects no longer seemed mysterious, but instead perfectly useful. Unconsciously, she began matching the items, jars of salves, boxes of herbs, with the chants and the instructions of the book. She felt sadness over the loss of Erzuli, and wondered if she had been unworthy of the goddess. Something flickered in the corner of her mind. She reached for her mother's uanga, which still hung at her throat. Inside was the tiny skull and the moonstone. These things kept her safe. I will not perform the ceremony, she thought. The memory of the dark figure was too terrifying, and somehow they were inextricably joined. She found herself drawn into the great leather volume once more, newly mesmerized by the words. Deeper and deeper she plunged into the sounds of the chants, rolling the songs over in her mind. Later that day there was a knock at her door. The key jingled, and when the door opened, her father was standing there. To her surprise, he was contrite, even remorseful. May I speak with you, Angelique? I won't perform the ceremony. It's deceitful. I'm sick of it. I won't do anything for you ever again. I have decided to let you go. She was stunned. You are right. I have misused you. You have every reason to resent me. But I have much to fear today, and I only ask your help one more time. No. You, you can't make me do it. Ethan Angelique. I have found your mother. She is working at the plantation at Trinity as a physician in the slave hospital. I will take you to her tomorrow. Angelique could not believe his words. Joy surged through her body. I beg you to do this for me. I have to alert the authorities. Perhaps this plot can be avoided, but the slaves are obviously eager for revenge. She could see beads of sweat dotting his forehead. I have promised them a ceremony, and I'll sacrifice a goat. My hope is they will be so caught up in their dancing they won't turn against me. At that instant, she heard the drums begin. She felt a quickening within her. Faintly, she heard the chanting, and the wisps of smoke from the ritual fire seemed to curl in her nostrils. If you will appear in the ceremony... I give you my word. I will return you to your mother. All right, she said simply. I will become Erzuli one more time. The night was still, and the air was warm and moist. It was midnight, and the drums were pounding more insistently than ever behind the doors of the chapel. Thais prepared her for the ceremony, and Angelique looked at the gray head and stooped shoulders of the slave. Thais' spirit is broken, she thought. 
thoughts of her mother flooded her mind, and she felt the tears brimming in her eyes. It was three years since she had seen her. She had grown, and her mother might not recognize her. She was tall, and her hips curved above long, slender legs. As she smoothed the white gown over her stomach, the dress felt tight, as if it had been made for a much smaller girl. Angelique was struck by something she had always known but never given much thought. There had been other goddesses before her. Will they choose another Erzuli? she asked Tyus. Yes, child, when you'll be a woman. But this is my last time. Father is letting me go tomorrow. What do you mean, last time? Tyus cried, her voice sharp. He's promised to take me back to my mother. Tyus clasped Angelique by her arms. He won't let you go? She raised her hands and let out a wail. Oh, Lord God in heaven, help us. A sob wrenched in her throat. Oh, Tyus, I will miss you. Don't cry. But, child, you can't know what's to happen to you. I'm going to see my mother again. You've no idea how lonely I've been. And now it's all over, Tyus. Tyus, what's the matter? Tyus was sitting with her arms around her stomach, rocking as though she were in pain. She looked at Angelique and her lips formed words that made no sound. The sacrifice. At that instant, Angelique heard a cart rumbling on the courtyard stones, and she ran to the window to see Father Lebro, his wooden cross bouncing upon his chest. Immediately, her father was at her door. What are you doing? He glowered at Tyus. Bring her down. Tyus stared at him with such contempt that Angelique thought she must have lost her senses. Her father's face darkened with rage. Come, he growled, seizing Angelique. They were halfway down the staircase when they met with Father Lebro, the round-faced priest. B -b -b Bouchard, he cried out in consternation. I, I, I have come to tell you, you, you must not do this dreadful thing. But Angelique's father brushed him by with complete indifference. Pulling her by the arm, he dragged her through the open doorway. The priest ran after them, shouting, Sacrilege! Call upon the devil and the devil will come! I promise you that! Your soul is lost! Do not sacrifice your own daughter to the powers of evil! Angelique was astonished by his vehemence. Off with you, you old fool! Theodore, I beg you! The priest threw himself in their path, raising his hands in prayer. Angelique was amazed to see tears running down his cheeks. With a kick to the head, her father knocked him to the ground. Father, she cried, struck by his cruelty. He jerked Angelique across the dark courtyard towards the chapel. The worshippers were in full ceremony, and she met with a rush of the drums. The naked dancers enveloped her in a dark cocoon, and she trembled at the power of their adoration. A sullen lust more frightening than ever before. Her father dragged her to the altar. The fire was bright. The porcelain platter lay before her, clean and shining. And she thought of the goat, which should have been tied, ready for the sacrifice, but was not there. Panic fluttered in her heart. The chanting rose mournfully, and the flames of a thousand candles threw shadows on the walls. Suddenly, she felt her father seize her hands and wrench her arms behind her. She cried out in pain as, with a quick twist of a rope, he bound her wrists. A chalice was raised to her lips, but she took one sip and let the burning liquid flow back into the cup. She did not want to be drugged. Why was she bound? And then, in one shattering jolt, she understood. A colder fear than she had ever known flowed through her. She saw their eyes burning with hunger, felt their fingers grazing her legs, prodding her thighs, and something else was there, some other dark presence, icy hands groping, a voice. I am here. At that instant, through the smoke, she saw the Chris. She saw the jeweled handle catch the firelight and explode with vivid slivers of color. She was hypnotized as the dagger rose above her head, and then as the chanting grew, she felt a sudden stab of pain. She heard terrified screams, the screams she had heard that first night when she waited in the tower, screams that had haunted her dreams, but now... The screams were her own. The dagger rose again, and she saw her father's face warped with fury as the knife plunged again, ripping into her flesh. And then, 
She felt the floor beneath her split open and freezing air float up under her feet. Visions of ink-stained pages flew past her inner eye. From beneath her twisted love for her father and the anguish of his betrayal, she summoned the power within her, a force ancient and tempered. She drew the magic, glittering and dark, and felt her body grow rigid as she became the Chris, sharp, faceted. She heard her father cry out as the knife came to life in his hand. She saw his horror as he forced it back, fought its downward plunge. But he had rather stopped the lightning in the sky. Like an arrow loosed from a bow, she was the Chris, and she wrote it into his heart. Angelique! A ray of light pierced the darkness. Are you still there? Yes, Cesar. Oh, good. I worry for you. Don't move. I'll be back. Cesar, what's happening? Are we safe? Just stay quiet. I come soon. It was difficult to know exactly where she was. She was shivering, curled into a ball. And she had been waiting for what seemed like hours, hidden beneath the deck. The creaking of the boat and the gentle slapping of the water against the hull were mingled with the groaning of the anchor chain. There was another sound beneath her, the moaning of slaves chained in the hole. Her mind snarled with images of her escape. She remembered her father collapsing at her feet and feeling the deathly quiet when the drums ceased. She could still see the slaves stunned by her power, afraid she would strike them. And then, from nowhere, her bounds were loosed, a firm hand clasped hers tightly, and she was running through the chapel with Cesar and out the wide doors. They hung for an instant at the edge of the parapet. Dark water swirled beneath them before he cried, Jump! And then they plunged into the sea. She clawed to the surface, Cesar at her side, thrashing, barely staying afloat. The ship is there, he shouted, and she saw the long black hull riding the swell. She swam, Cesar beside her, as the swinging lights on the schooner's side rose up and then dipped from sight. Exhausted, they found a rope and climbed aboard. On the deck, they found a small hatch, which opened to the hold. Hide! Climb in there! he hissed. She climbed down into the darkness. He shot her away again and was gone. She waited for hours, thinking about all that had occurred, tortured by remorse. She had killed her father. An unthinkable crime. She had done it to save herself... But who would believe her now that she was completely alone? She had no idea whether her father had told her the truth about her mother being at Trinité. But she was terrified at the prospect of returning to Saint-Pierre. The planters were aware of her true parentage. The priest undoubtedly knew. Would she face charges of murder? Perhaps no one knew what had happened. If the slaves did revolt, her father's death might be blamed on the rebellion and she would be free. There was another nagging thought in her mind. Her powers, still new and unfamiliar, baffled her. Could she really be a sorceress? Until now she had been a simple girl, thrust into the pretense of being a goddess. Sometimes she had been seduced by the fervor of the worship, but she had never believed she was a spirit. Was the power she possessed from God or from evil? Was she the servant? of the devil she could feel him now down in the hold she had only to think of him and his touch became palpable intimate the moans of the slaves woeful and forlorn became his voice and in the murky air she saw the curve of the hull open and the sea water rush in rising over her in black waves she closed her eyes and heard her heartbeat quick and high pitched then she heard another, deep and throbbing, within her, two hearts beating together. No, she breathed, the hair rising on her arms. Don't. She could see him now, as the velvet sea swirled into robes, his eyes were flaming coals, and his skin as smooth as obsidian. He was close to her, and she felt the cold seawater spreading beneath her, icy fingers traveling under her clothes. 
stiffened as he explored her, caresses stinging, until finally... Angelique, come with me now. Who is it? I saved you. I was there with you. Come with me. But tell me who you are. <laughs> you have always known my lovely one. So why do you ask? If I give you a name, will you be satisfied? I will. I am the one who lives for you. Longs for you alone. The Horned God. Oh, Dark One. Leave me. I empowered you. You are my servant now. That was not you. I did that. How were you able to kill your father? I felt the power within me. I made that choice. To use me. I do know who you are. Evil personified. Be gone. We'll meet again, Angelique. You can never escape me. I'm in your thoughts. Always. Angelique's Descent continues in Part 2, Betrayal. How did I come to write Angelique's Descent? Well, I was taking screenwriting classes at UCLA, and uh, Caitlin Blaisdell, who is an editor at HarperCollins, asked me to meet with her, and she said, we're thinking of doing a series of Dark Shadows novels, and we understand you've been studying writing, and we would just love it if you would do one. And I said, do what? And they said, well, write a novel. And I said, I have no idea how to write a novel. I don't see how I could begin to do it. And she said, oh, well, don't worry about it. We'll just, um, the best thing would be to be able to use your name. So you just turn something in, and we have real writers who will fix it all up and make it sound good. <laughs> so I was incensed. I said, you mean you expect me to work that long on a novel, and then someone's going to change every word? And she kind of shrugged, and so I said I would do it, and then I... I was determined that they would not change a word. I spent a, a lot of time reading books, starting with Charles Dickens and Robert Louis Stevenson, and I read Daphne du Maurier, and I kept trying to find some kind of model, and I read Dracula and Frankenstein, and after a while I began to kind of absorb the, the feel of a horror novel. So then I just started writing, for better or for worse. <laughs> inspirations for the book. I think the first one was, it's very strange the way this process of writing fiction works. You, you find you draw from all kinds of places in your own life. And I had gone to Nepal, I'd taken a trip to Nepal, and I found in Kathmandu, I'd seen this young girl called the Living Goddess. She was up in a room above the street, and she looked down on the people walking back and forth and she was all made up with white makeup and black eye coal, coal around her eyes and and she was dripping with jewels and she had long black hair and she had the most mournful expression on her face she was so bored and the people would, would go by and they would leave her offerings of flowers and pray to her but she just looked like a fat she was very fat bored 12 year old and i thought what in the world who is she and the guide said, well, she's the living goddess, and she's chosen in this horrible test in which all the little girls that are of the right age are put in a room 
with a, the head of a dead buffalo, and then dogs are let loose in the room, famished dogs, and the only little girl who doesn't cry is chosen to be the living goddess. Well, I thought that was really fascinating. Two things. One, the ordeal, and the other, the fact that she was obviously so bored and unhappy. And he said, and she's completely isolated. She has no childhood, and she is the living goddess until she reaches puberty, and then she's replaced. I was very intrigued by that story, and I, it was kind of the jumping-off place for what I thought might have been Angelique's childhood in the Caribbean. I actually did an enormous amount of research. I did much more than I thought I would have to do. When I got into the voodoo, the voodun, as they call it, I realized that I really knew very little about it. So I read a lot about it, and I read Zora Neale Hurston's Tell My Horse, which is a wonderful book about the spells, about zombies and zombie powder and the kind of witchcraft they practice. The Loas, who are the gods they worship, they say the Loa rides them like a horse, which is where you get the idea of Tell My Horse. And Mules and Men, which is another book she wrote about uh, African spiritual and religious and the superstition of their religion. And I read Four Doors Guide to the Caribbean <laughs> and uh, James Michener's The Caribbean, and that's kind of the spectrum, because I, I read a lot, and then I realized that I was uh, doing a lot of reading and I was remembering absolutely nothing. So I sort of had to just go back and start over, and I had to learn about the sugar plantations and the slave trade and, and all of that, that uh, because I wanted it to feel real. And, of course, I'd never felt that I really knew enough to know what I was writing, and I you know, grappled with that. A lot of that is in the book and is not in the recording, all of the spells that Angelique learned. I found a wonderful book called The Catholic Crusoe at the main library downtown. They, I wasn't allowed to take the book out, but it was The Adventures of Owen Evans Esquire, Adventures of a Surgeon's Mate in 1739. And uh, that's where I got the character of Father Lebro because on this ship of this young surgeon's mate, it went to the Caribbean and Father Lebro was aboard the ship. So I found a lot of wonderful sources. <laughs> 